Good morning, everybody. Um, I think we've left a bit of time for the late people to come, so we should get started. I'd like to welcome you all to the first of two uh, blocks on uh, geocomplexity and scales. And as you are probably aware, this uh, union session is fitting into the um, our theme this year, which is a voyage through scales. Uh, so we've organized sessions which are trying to give a, a kind of a broad view of all the different aspects of geosciences where, uh, where we can understand uh, geocomplexity not only at one scale but over a range. And uh, I'd like to uh, start the session by asking Anika Okay, to come and uh, tell us about waves and vorticities and, vor and vortices in rotating stratified turbulence. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for the invitation, and thank you for all those people who, who woke up early to be here. So let me see if I got it. There we are. So turbulence is a multiscale problem. You all know that. But on the other hand, there are many um, different phenomena that occur. For example, in the galaxy, you have supernova explosion, you're highly supersonic, whereas um, in the Earth, you're fortunately subsonic. So um, turbulence is also occurring in a lot of other phenomena through nonlinearities. And here I give you an amusing example of quasi-2D turbulence in some bacteria. So it's a broad-minded topic. Now, if we take that slide about the atmosphere, you see that you can go from the planetary scale, 10,000 kilometers, down to the millimeter where turbulence is being dissipated through a range of scales and a range of structures that have been identified by meteorologists. And there is organization of clouds and individual clouds. And at each of those scales, there are different phenomena occurring. Um, that you have to take in, into account. For example, at the very small scales, you can talk about the chemistry of such clouds and the precipitation. Now, a global model, let's see if I can. Uh, global model will resolve only the larger scales and all the others will be modeled. And in general, the model is isotropic and yet the physics is anisotropic down to almost the cloud and interaction. The larger dissimulation, on the other hand, will resolve intermediate scale and model the small scales. And the crazy people trying to do DNS, and I'm one of them, are resolving scales which are about up to a meter if we want to resolve the Kolmogorov scale where energy is dissipated. And that means that all the rest is given through forcing um, of the system. Now, we can do something better quote, end quote, if we decide that we don't need a Reynolds number of the atmosphere, say 10 to the 8, but we can decrease that Reynolds number to something which is a bit more likely, like 10 to the 4, for high uh, resolution direct numerical simulation today, hoping for the best. That is to say that no other instability comes in, and therefore our, the problem uh, from a smaller Reynolds number, we can scale it to the larger Reynolds number. But uh, nevertheless, even then, the direct numerical simulation will be, if I can find this mouse, um, will not go all the way to the planetary scale. Now, uh, therefore, as you look at different issues and, and different scales, you are going to um, look at different problems with different physics and different equations. And I stole that slide from Roy Rasmussen showing that hydrology, whether you do it at the basin scale or whether you do it at the city scale, you are going to encounter diff different problems. Here is a, an amusing vision of the ocean, amusing for people doing turbulence, because what they do is with um, satellites, they have two satellites which are on the same trajectory, and they are one minute apart, and one minute is a very small time for the ocean. So the denoise means that the difference between the signal of those two satellites is noise, and they remove it. 
And then what they do through a model, which is uh, coupling the sea surface height, which they measure, coupling it to the velocity field, then they can deduce the velocity field and its scaling properties. And what you see is an isotropized um, spectra for the old Earth with the Pacific Ocean in the middle, right? And if you know nothing about this problem, you see that on the one hand you can be yellow, orange, red. On the other hand, you can be green and blue. That is to say, the tropics are very different from the higher latitudes. That's really striking. Now, what's different in the tropics are two things, at least. <laughs> one is the moisture and the other one is the rotation, because the rotation depends on the latitude. But the other thing that could be different is that the model through which you deduce the velocity field may not also apply. So all those uh, elements come into account, but it is rather interesting to see that map where Kolmogorov, your familiar turbulence, uh, appears here in orange. And it appears at those currents that emanate from the coasts. Um, here is the Gulf Stream, the Kuroshio, or the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that are more energetic and then turbulence can develop locally through instabilities. So we see that at different scales we can have different dynamics and different regime. Okay, so I will try to talk about three problems. I may not make it to the third one. And I want to show how adding simple, quote unquote, linear waves to the familiar problem, if unresolved, of uh, nonlinear turbulence, change things, change some of the things that we held dear and after all, appear different. So what are the equations for the problem? It's Navier-Stokes, it's incompressible, and we're gonna take the Boussinesque approximation whereby we are um, perturbing around a constant profile of density or temperature. N is the brun weissala frequency, and uh, kappa is the diffusivity of the temperature. So you have an equation for the velocity with the Coriolis force here, F is the Coriolis parameter, the rotation, and the gravity. They are both assumed collinear because we don't want to introduce one more parameter in this problem, which already has four parameters. The usual one, the Reynolds number, is as usual very large. We shall eliminate the parental number by saying it's one. It's not really one in reality, it's between three and 0.3, but that's not a very big difference, so we'll, we'll, uh, we don't want to resolve one more scale, which would be the two dissipation scales of the two fields. So the rotation is adimensionalized through the Rosby number, and the stratification, the, the di dimensionless number, is the full number. When they are very small, that's their definition, then you have very strong waves. In other words, the linear terms here dominate a priori the nonlinear term, which is hidden here in the advection. Okay, though that system support uh, waves, the frequency of which is given here, but we are more interested in the, in, the, in the turbulence regime, so what happens? One of the remarks, and I'm gonna make it simple, is due to beyond Chomas. It's something that was known, but they, they give a good uh, explanation for it, which is that the system can develop the land scale it wants in the vertical. So let's call that scale the buoyancy scale. It is such that turbulence is strong in the vertical. In other words, the fruit number associated with the land scale in the vertical is of order unity. What you immediately get then, using the divergence free condition, is that that land scale is smaller by a factor of fruit. Fruit number is small. Say, in the atmosphere, it could be 10 minus 3. And uh, the vertical velocity is also small. So then we can define a buoyancy Reynolds number based on that vertical velocity and vertical land scale. And um, it is the Reynolds number multiplied by the full number square. This number is large in the atmosphere. This number, it is difficult to make it large in numerical simulation unless you sacrifice the full number, that is to say, you're close to a full number of one, which means that the time scale associated with the wave and the time scale of the ADs is close, the, the ratio is close to one, so it's not very strongly stratified. Another scale that you can define in such flows is the Osmidov scale, and the way you get that expression is that you say that the AD turnover time and the wave time, they are equal at that scale, using the fact that beyond that scale you are going to recover Kolmogorov. 
That's where the three-fourth comes in. So then you discover that the interpretation of the buoyancy balance number is that it's the ratio of the Osmidas scale to the dissipation scale. So it says that my flow is really turbulent if at the Osmidas scale and at smaller scales, I have a Reynolds number, buoyancy Reynolds number, that's large. So it's a way to uh, mix This is not turning, okay. This, it's a way to, to mix um, the, uh, the waves and the eddies. Now, this is not a perfect example because the two runs that you see here are not exactly the same, but I'm trying to sh show you what it means to resolve the scale at which you recover, presumably, uh, isotropy. So, what I said about the Osmidov scale, you can do the same with your rotation. It's called the Zeeman scale. And here you have a Rossby of 0.06, and here a Rossby of 0.07, so they're very close. But what differs is the Reynolds number. There is a factor four or five between the two. So this flow here is much more turbulent than the other one. Now, the difference, that's why it's not a perfect comparison, is that the forcing scale here is at seven, a seventh of the scale of the box, whereas here it's at four because we were trying to maximize the Reynolds number. So you see that if the turbulence is not very strong, then what happens is that you form structures and some of them are not very turbulent. In fact, those columns that you see here are fully helical and they're laminar in the sense that if you uh, seed particles, the, the trajectory of those particles follow each other for quite a while along those columns. Now, once you do the same problem, so you are forcing here with a fully Beltrami, fully helical flow, once you do the same, the almost same problem, but you let the Reynolds number be higher, you see that those columns are shrouded by smaller scales. So that small scale, you do recover some turbulence. So you have the signature of the waves in the sense that you have those columns who are rotating here, but you have the signature of the turbulence in the sense that you have eddies sh shrouding them. Okay, so the mathematicians have done their job. They have a small parameter, say the food number, and according to how they rescale the, the time, the horizontal scales and the vertical scales, you can have a lot of regime which are listed here, and I recommend reading this paper by Klein, um, some of which were already known. So you see that according to how you scale the scale, if I may say, that, if I might say so, then you can have very different regimes in those systems, and that's why they are so complex. The other parameter of the problem is anisotropy. I mean, the, um, the atmosphere is about as thin as a piece of paper. It's very thin compared, and same thing for the ocean, very thin compared to the lateral dimension, and when you make that parameter enter the problem, different things can happen. So it is really a parameter of the problem as well. Now, for, that's a slide of advertisement. If you're interested in a code that do those problems, that scale from your laptop to supercomputers, um, do ask us or send an email to Pablo Minini or Duane Rosenberg. Um, it's fun to to do physics with them. So, okay, let's look at the first problem, which is geosophic balance. Geosophic balance is a godsend to meteorologists. They've been working on it for a long time because basically they say that, let me go to the equation first. Where is it? Here. Here is the definition of geostrophic balance. Let's forget about temporal dependence. Let's forget about those nonlinear terms. Let's do a balance between the pressure gradient, the Coriolis force, and gravity. Then what you get is what is called geostrophic balance. It's very simple. And because you have a, a gradient and you're incompressible, you get rid of it by taking the curl. And that's then you turn, turn the crank. And Hyde in 1976 showed that you could uh, create helicity in those flows. Helicity is the correlation between velocity and vorticity. It means that your flow is still isotropic in the sense that you can express correlation functions in terms of the wave number, but on the other hand, it's not symmetric whether uh, <clears throat> you turn right or you turn left. So helicity is created in such flows as shown by Hyde, and um, as we showed verified numerically many years ago because no, no one had done it yet. I think there are still a lot of open questions about helicity 
and um, it's a problem that is worth uh, continuing. So let me go back to try to motivate you. Illicity, as I said, this is the perfect example. I'm pointing to myself, which is not very useful. This is a perfect example of a non-helical structure because you have a vortex ring in the plane, the vorticity is perpendicular to it, and the dot product is zero. What you need is to do linking of those flux tubes or also twisting of those flux tubes. And very simply put, when you want to express helicity, you take your velocity correlation function and uh, you introduce the, that tensor, anti-symmetric tensor, and the helicity, which is a pseudo-scalar, changes sign if you change from a right-handed to a left-handed system. Helicity is the part um, proportional to um, the anti-symmetric part. Helicity is measured in the atmosphere, and its importance has been uh, emphasized all the way back from Lily and in particular in hurricanes or also in tornadoes, it's not difficult to imagine because if your flow is highly quasi-two-dimensional, rotating very fast, it's 2D, but if you have an updraft or a downdraft, then this vertical velocity is gonna be parallel to the vorticity coming from your quasi-2D flow and therefore helicity is strong. So it is one of the uh, <clears throat> things they measure to try to predict hurricanes, although of course it's difficult. The signature of helicity on the energy spectrum is visible at night. The solid black lines are during the day and you have more or less a Kolmogorov spectrum, K to the, or here, temporal frequency to the minus five third. But you see that at night, the gray lines, they're flat. Something is happening and this spectrum is uh, different from what happens during the day. At night, the boundary layer, the planetary boundary layer is more stable and it shows a different dynamics. Something that you can recover through numerical simulation as the stratification increase from blue to red, the part of the helicity spectrum that is flat increases also. So there is a signature of helicity in the, um, as you measure. The other thing that's different uh, for helicity is that the temporal decay of energy is different in the presence of helicity and stratification. In the presence of only, of only helicity but no stratification, you see that the decay of the energy, that's the energy as a function of time, the decay of the energy is delayed but after that, the power law is the same. Whereas if you introduce waves and helicity, the decay of energy becomes very slow. Now you can recover that power minus one third during dimensional analysis, I will not bother you with it. Once you have more than one parameter in the problem, there are a lot of things you can do with dimensional analysis and you believe it or you don't and you have to look at data whether, to see whether you're believable. But certainly, helicity plays a role and slows down the decay of the energy um, in a rotating or in a stratified flow. Now, um, the one thing you probably believe about turbulence is that in three dimensions, you have a direct cascade of energy. That direct cascade is a five-third Kolmogorov spectrum. Here there is no rotation, no stratification. The flux is zero at large scale and positive and constant at small scale. The one thing you believe about two-dimensional turbulence is that it is the inverse. You have an energy cascade going to the large scale and the flux indeed of the energy is negative and semi-constant at large scale and zero at small scale. So the paradigm is with two invariants with a different physical dimension, you have a dual but mutually exclusive cascade of energy. And what has been discovered in the last five years by several uh, authors is that it ends so. It's not so simple. There are ways you can do things differently in, in, uh, in several cases. Here the motivation is the ocean, not the atmosphere any longer. So we look at the southern ocean, which is really a big merry-go-round for the water, right? There is only one continent, Antarctica, and then the water does what it wants. So we take a typical velocity of, say, four centimeters per second. We take a characteristic frequency as measured. 
and the rotation is given at mid-latitude, so we know what is the ratio of the Brun-Weissala to the Coriolis frequency, or in other words, how fast is the stratification compared to the rotation. That gives us characteristic number for the ocean, where we cheat, of course, is the viscosity. There is no way we can do a Reynolds number of 2 to 10 to the 7 using a Dirac simulation. So we're putting a little cube of turbulence right there in the Kerguelen plateau, say, and looking at what happens in that little cube. So it's realistic, except for the Reynolds number as usual. The measure of the velocity and of the temperature the numbers I gave you are come from <clears throat> measures in the southern ocean here in the Drake Passage. So they are realistic numbers. And then you do an exploration of parameter space. This is completely crazy because you have so many parameters. You explore at fixed food along a vertical varying the rotation. You explore along an horizontal at fixed Rossby varying the food number. And then you also explore at fixed N over F and see what happens. To make a long story short, what people observe in the ocean, this is the flux of energy, and they observe that it is both constant, quote unquote, but mind you, it's an observation and a remarkable one. They observe that the flux is negative at large scale and positive at large scale, at small scale. And they don't know if that's realistic. They are not sure it's true. But indeed, the numerical simulation proved the same. Here is the flux for a variety of parameters that are written here, Reynolds number, Froude number, and Rossby number. And you see that indeed, in such a flow, and again, it's not the only flow where that happens. There are several examples now that we know, for example, quantum turbulence. Um, we, we see that there is a flux of energy which is constant. No, give and take that it's a big numerical simulation. Um, constant at large scale and negative, and constant at small scale and positive. And the ratio of the two varies in a way that seems compatible with what we observe in the ocean. This is how this flow looks like. This is the velocity, the vertical velocity. And the forcing scale is in green at the bottom of your screen. It's about a tenth of the box. And you see that on the one hand you form large scales, which are the filament, and if, there were, if it was not for the coupling to the velocity field, the temperature would be a passive scalar, and we know it develops filaments. And on the other hand, locally, you have very small scale and very strong small scales that develop, and which is links, links to which is linked to instabilities, Kelvin-Helmholtz type, for example. So you have a flow which has the double signature of the double cascade of having large scales, including vortices and filaments, and of having uh, small scales that are extremely energetic. energetic. Okay, I do have a little time to talk about intermittency, so let me skip. Three minutes, two minutes, three minutes. Okay, let, let, let me skip uh, most of it, but there's another belief of turbulence is that the velocity is a potato, it's a Gaussian, very well behaved, the velocity gradients are intermittent in the sense that they have wings in their PDF, large wings. And what we discovered here, and again, in fact, once you discover something, you see that other people have seen it in different instances. So let me skip all that. Then, um, the model is very simple. You say, okay, what matters is the, is the vertical velocity and the vertical length scale, and I'm going to write a model for this, the dw square represents a nonlinear term, and this is a linear term. So there are two guys, velocity and temperature, so there are three regimes. One dominates the other one, the other dominates the first one, and they're equal. So when the nonlinear term dominates, it's turbulence as usual. When stratification dominates, you, der you derive a second time and you have an, an harmonic oscillator, so it's just a boring wave, and when the two are equal, you can convince yourself that it is like what is called the saturation spectrum in the ocean, and um, what you get is a reinforcement when delta theta is the right sign of the construction of very strong gradients, because the equations x equal minus x square blows up in a finite time. And indeed, this is what the model tells us. Here is the usual turbulence, so intermittent, you know. And here you're putting the waves, and you see that for intermediate values of the stratification, those three curves, the 
constructions of negative gradients is very strong. So the paradox of observing a planetary boundary layer at night, which is very intermittent, even though it's very stable through the stratification, is in fact can be modeled through that simple model LAVA force. And here has the PDF. So you can say, well, oh, the numbers are not here, but let's say we go to uh, values that are twice as big as what you expect for a Gaussian, it's not much, except that uh, we are explicit in time, and therefore we have to uh, lower the time step. So it matters. So flows with waves can be more intermittent than in turbulence. So let me conclude. What I want to argue is that we need large resolutions for direct numerical simulations to understand flows with rotation and stratification. Now, this is costly, but the problem is that there are different scales. It's a multi-scale problem. There are different scales, different time scales, different regime. And to be able to talk, tell them apart, we have to resolve them. So there are several things I have not talked about and we, we don't know yet, which is what is the partition of energy between the waves, on the other hand, you can linearize the system, and the eddies. What is the partition of energy between the kinetic and the potential energy, and what is the role of potential vorticity, which is a Lagrangian invariant? And I'll stop here. Thank you. OK, we have some time for questions. Any questions? <laughs> I could, okay, okay, Daniel. What is the question? Um, you spoke about uh, the intermittency of the vertical velocity itself. You have the same behavior for the horizontal velocity on, on the hot rate. Is it the usual folklore that the velocity is rather smooth and uh, only at the fluctuation line? Yeah, that is a good question. I didn't say, indeed, the horizontal velocity here is well behaved. That is to say, it's Gaussian. So it's only the vertical velocity, and this is why this little model works, because the stratification works in the vertical, right? There's a GZ. So it's only the vertical velocity component which is affected by the stratification. Now, in the rotating case, it might be different, and I think there is a lot to explore here. But I would think that this is a very simple model that goes with the observations of one of the mystery of uh, meteorology, which is that the planetary boundary layer, when it is stable, when you have waves that are very strong in there, you have a full number which is 10 minus 2, or even smaller, and yet the flow can snap. And it's true that little model. We are reinforcing the negative gradients uh, through this term when the phase is right. And it's probably linked to critical layers, but Pablo Minini has a paper on that. Other questions? Yeah, Peter. Does work to, to a good extent. 
Do you have a question? I have a question. Um, maybe someone else will think of something. But we did some uh, experiments with drop sounds in the atmosphere, so we could have I don't know about a factor of a thousand, a thousand measurements, five meter resolution or so. And uh, we found that the structure was such that you had a kind of a fractal set of instable regions. That means n squared negative on a, on a fractal set. And uh, how would that, I mean, you would think that that would essentially prevent propagation of gravity waves, for instance. So how would that affect your well, picture? I, I think Unstable local there is, and that I cannot treat with the ta mm. this type of approach. I have to ch mm. change the sign <coughs> of, the, of the wave time. Right? But it seemed that on every case there was this fractal hierarchy. But I do think that that's the typical multiscale problem. Mm. I'm not going to tell you what that is. Right? That is to say that the large scale, um, you see, the small parameter of the problem to be turbulence is the ratio of the wave time to the nonlinear time. That ratio depends on scale. There is a scale at which the ratio is no more small, and therefore the turbulence, the, the intermittency comes in, absolutely. So you will have it at small scale, and we already see it in the picture I showed of the velocity. So you have, you have that living of those two guys, the wave and the eddies, okay. right, in the same flow, and you try to analyze it through those filters, <coughs> that those filters are limited because they don't take into account the other guy. Last question? If not, I would like to thank the speaker for more or less on time, in fact. And I'd like now to uh, welcome Anna Barras to give us a talk about transient scaling behavior and predictability of atmospheric moisture, clouds, and precipitation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, what I'm going to do is to sort of walk us a little bit through uh, like 10 years of work uh, doing scaling analysis and looking at, at precipitation and cloud processes um, in, uh, in my group. So most of the work we do is really looking at mountain processes. And so you'll see a lot of focus on orographic precipitation and, uh, and orographic uh, uh, clouds. We're going to be very simple here <laughs> in terms of uh, the metrics that we'll be using, and this is the extent to which I'm going to have any equations here. So we're going to use two different types of metrics um, to look at, at, uh, at the scaling behavior using multifractals and, uh, and basic um, spectral scaling and focusing on, okay, let me see if I can uh, manage this. Uh, intermittency factors in the terms of the of the of of multifractals and focusing on beta in terms of uh, of um, uh, spectral scaling and uh, you know keep in mind uh, the five thirds factor that we're always looking for. <laughs> um, so the first time we actually started uh, using multifractors was about. Uh, almost 15 years ago, and we were looking for ways of describing extremes, and we had uh, uh, attended a couple of talks by, uh, by Daniel and, uh, and Sean, and, it, and I was convinced you know, this was a great way of looking at, at the problem. And so we took thousands of gauges in the, in the eastern United States and did a, a basic standard analysis to estimate PMP, the probable maximum precipitation. Now, we calculated our values, we published the paper and so on, but what was interesting from this, and, and that was not the focus of that paper, was that as we started looking at the spatial distribution of the multifractal parameters, we clearly could see spatial regimes, and those regimes were consistent with what we knew the meteorology was, with, with orography in some cases, and uh, at the Gulf of Mexico influencing the in this part, and basically hurricanes and landfall along the along uh, the coastal plain. So this was, you know, the first hint of, of the spatial variability, and uh, and the, and this sort of spatial organization in terms of, of physical regimes. Then later on, actually, 
substantially later, we used the same approach, but in this case to actually intercompare observations with model data and satellite data. And so the idea was to actually use these measures as, as metrics of how good the models are or how good the uh, the satellite products are. Not so much focusing on whether the precipitation amount is exactly right, but are the dynamics of the precipitation processes as re represented by those data sets, you know, consistent with what's observed or not. And so, of course, you know, there are issues of scales when you're looking at rain gauges versus, for example, a, um, a satellite product. But you can see here in the case, you know, this is alpha, this is uh, uh, C1, and you see that in many cases there are very strong agree agreements, but in other cases there's very strong disagreement between what models do, and in this case, in the middle, this is actually a regional reanalysis. And so what is happening is that even though these rain gauges are actually assimilated into this model data, you know, there's substantial modification of, uh, of what goes on. And for example, this here is a clear artifact. This is not real. And this is a big danger with, with satellite data. This is an artifact of how different types of satellite uh, uh, products are combined. But again, spatial variability, spatial organization. Then we were doing some work in the Himalayas, collecting observations and doing uh, some uh, modeling work. And one of the things we found was, in, uh, these are results from um, uh, the TRIM satellite. So when you look at data over a long period of time and you identify specific features, what you find is there's a very strong organization of, for example, embedded convection with with the, uh, the landscape. And this is not just something that happens in one season. It happens one year, another year. And in fact, what you'll find is that it, it happens across the entire Himalayan range. So if you look across uh, the Himalayan range, we see this organization of these precipitation features always happening at the tips of the same ridges, year in, year out. So even though precipitation is not predictable, <laughs> it's actually very predictable in the sense that things tend to organize in very specific ways. And this is, for example, uh, 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 the Kaligandaki River, and you can see it in all of these features here. And, uh, and it's a major feature, and around it we see a lot of, of organization. So thinking about this and, and looking at satellite data and so what it looks like in terms of the vertical distribution, I was really interested in looking at how can we try to incorporate uh, this understanding of, of the observations and explanation actually of the, of the processes um, into, into models. And, uh, and one of the, you know, the first question is, well, but what happens in terms of clouds then? So we took uh, IR cloud fields over the Himalayas also, did an analysis that was um, stratified by elevation. And so what you see here, again, is that looking at infrared imagery, so basically cloud fields from infrared, year in, year out, you see the same scaling behavior with elevation. So this is consistent with this role of topography in organizing the clouds and consequently organizing uh, rainfall. And so this became really sort of the theme of, of what we're looking for, is how do we actually describe this very strong and yet so difficult to, to predict uh, uh, co-organization. So the first uh, type of study that uh, we did was a very simple study using actually WORF, but at very high uh, spatial resolution, you know, nearly uh, uh, a large eddy simulation with, uh, with seven uh, vertical layers. And basically we had a core mountain, and on top of this mountain we added uh, uh, different types of, of, uh, of elevation, you know, variability. And, um, and then we, we changed the, uh, the conditions in the system. We had a, 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 very, a very humid, you know, a lower layer, and then very strong uh, decay and, uh, and the drying above. And then the, the types of tests were to uh, lapse rate, really, uh, by specifying uh, the surface uh, temperature, and, uh, and also playing with wind. So basically, uh, the scale of the anomaly in terms of the terrain elevation on, on the topography, uh, uh, the lapse rate effect, and, uh, and wind velocity. And 
uh, a conditionally, uh, you know, unstable, you know, it's really stable, but, you know, uh, uh, given this distribution and stable flow. And so basically, you know, these kinds of tests were, were built on, on Dale Duran's uh, uh, work of uh, over many years in uh, uh, looking at linear, you know, theory uh, investigation of photographic precipitation effect. So we simulated a, a number of, of different types of 3D simulations with, with this uh, uh, setup. And I'll show you, I'll focus results on the, on, on, on the sensitivity to, to the changes in the surface temperature. So one thing that was really interesting about these very simple uh, tests is that if you look at the structure functions for cloud water, for rain, and uh, for the terrain, you see the terrain is not scaling, but the cloud water and uh, the rain are. And so this is really interesting because we start with a setup where in this case the terrain was not scaling, the initial profiles, the initial conditions, nothing was uh, scaling, and actually through the model dynamics we basically, the outcome, our cloud water and our rainfall uh, at the precipitation are, are, are actually scaling. But then if we look at, uh, at the sensitivity analysis and we look, for example, at the, the behavior or changes of the multifractal parameters with you know, the spatial, uh, the characteristic scale of the anomaly in the, in the elevation, or you know, more importantly, and I really want to focus on this, in terms of the lapse rate or sensitivity to the TS value, uh, at the surface, what I was very surprised and intrigued and, and I thought it was a great, a great result is that we actually see very strong organization. So there's you know, you know, clearly uh, uh, an evolution that is uh, at the same no matter where in the atmosphere we do the analysis is actually very similar in terms of the cloud water and rain which is consistent with what we had observed in, in uh, in reality, and uh, and so this was uh, you know this was a, a rewarding result because it also uh, suggests uh, some organization, and of course, within the context of our simulations, we have you know very cold, more stable regimes, and we have warmer and more unstable regimes. Uh, these are vertical velocities organized on top of the uh, the topography. So if we look at this then, and we look at the, uh, the, the, the dependence of, of, uh, of, for example, C1 with CAPE, what you see is, and I have here a couple of results as a function of the spatial, of the spatial length of the, the terrain anomaly, what you see is, is again, that we see a, a very deliberate behavior in terms of these uh, of, of these parameters, although this is a, a complex enough that it's very hard to, to, to actually represent in a, in, a, in a simple way. So what we looked at was basically try to look at the same problem, but now focusing on moist uh, brunt vesala frequency. And then when you look at that, you actually see that for the same type of problem, we see the multifractal parameter versus the, uh, the brunt of uh, uh, frequency, we see also this kind of very, uh, you know, nice uh, arrangement of the, of, the, of the variability. Now, it's not unambiguous, it's not completely unambiguous. And so one of the concerns we had was, well, we're dealing with a 3D problem, we're averaging this over, over 3D, and of course, you know, moisture is not uniformly distributed, even at our very high spatial resolution. And so what if we think about this in terms of this realized moist instability, which would be the product of the cloud fraction, of the actual cloud fraction by the uh, the moist uh, uh, brunt vesal instability. And then what you see is actually a very interesting result, right? We see a, a, a shift in the, in, the, in, the, in the dependence relationship, and we now have a very clear, uh, unique, unambiguous way of looking at what happens in terms of the, the transition between stable and unstable regimes, but actually nothing really improves in terms of, uh, of the highly uh, stable and unstable regimes. But in, and in fact, now if we look at all the simulations we've done, they actually all organize the same way. So what was interesting is that it, it you know, 
independently of changing winds or changing uh, the temperature or changing the scale of the for of the of uh, uh, the terrain and so on we see that this behavior is always there and uh, and so um, and so this is appealing <laughs> and uh, and uh, and, and intriguing, but it doesn't really help us a lot either. At this point, if we don't find a way of representing this in models that is straightforward and unambiguous. Now, if we look at actually the scaling behavior of these fields, what you see in terms of the beta is also is a very different type of, uh, of behavior with clearly a, a uh, a Kolmogorov you know, type of behavior here in, in the transition between stable and unstable. And then we have some uh, uh, you know, more clear uh, way of addressing uh, the stability uh, side of things on this side and, uh, and, uh, and on this side. So then we, we, ha we were pretty much uh, exhausted here with, uh, with this uh, you know, a sort of semi-idealized uh, simulations, and so the idea was to go next and look at very realistic uh, 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 situations. Of course, you compromise spatial resolution, and so, but really we wanted to look here at, at all sides of the problems, the, you know, the idea of verification and evaluation, understanding, and then think about how can we use this information to improve physical parameterizations uh, in the model. So to do this, we used some simulations that I talked about uh, on Monday, um, and, uh, and, and these were numerical experiments with WARF uh, over South America, so again, mountains, focusing on, uh, on the Andes. This uh, a domain here is at, is at one, uh, 1 1.2 kilometer resolution. This is at 18 kilometer resolution. And what, uh, the results that I'll be showing you are for three different cases, which are uh, uh, very characteristic. The first two of the, monsoons, of the monsoon season and um, uh, the third one of a very dry day in the, in the dry season. So basically when it's you know, there's no rain anywhere, pretty much in South America, so it couldn't be uh, it couldn't be more uh, more dry <laughs> uh, than that. So um, the the typical uh, synoptic situation during the monsoon is uh, is represented here in this uh, slide, and 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 so basically the important features are the incoming moisture flux, of course, fr uh, from the Atlantic over. Uh, the Amazon, the, uh, uh, the low-level jet that forms here along the, uh, the mountains barriers, and then uh, this anticyclone here, which also uh, plays an important role. Now, you'll have to believe me, our simulations are actually very good in terms of the rainfall, and especially in terms of localization of convective features. We did, we did comparisons with trim and so on. But basically what you see here, I have separated uh, daytime and, uh, and nighttime rainfall, and, uh, and you see how it's organized, highly organized, of course, in this case, with uh, the topography, which is interesting to us. One thing that I'd like to point out is how strong, how much stronger in this case we have rainfall at night actually than uh, during the day. So when you look at these cases and you look at them in terms, for example, of CAPE or in terms of the total condensate in, uh, in the atmosphere, in our smaller domain, what you see is, is basically what you expect. Our very dry case, we have no water <laughs> you know, condensed in the atmosphere, and so it, extremely low Cape values. And then in the other two cases, which are monsoon cases, we're going to have significant amounts of condensate in the atmosphere. You see that in the case of, of the weak low-level jet, we actually have higher amounts at night time, which is consistent with uh, the picture I was pointing out before, and then you see that in terms of CAPE we have, you know, pretty reliable uh, uh, CAPE all day long. So basically we have very unstable conditions versus very stable conditions, and in the case of the unstable conditions we have high amounts of moisture in the atmosphere which are being really transformed into clouds and rainfall. So, and, um, so the first thing we did was to look at the ensemble kinetic energy behavior uh, uh, 
the scaling behavior for our, our three cases. So at uh, the very dry stable case on top, and then at the weak low-level jet case, and the strong low-level jet case. And so what you see here is that in the case of, the, of, uh, of E-dry, we have, this is a scaling in the X uh, direction, so longitudinal, and, and this is in the Y direction, which is latitudinal, and you see that basically they scale you know, the same way, and we have a beta of two. Now, when we go into the cases where we have instability, we see that in one of our, in, in both the, uh, directions, in the case of the weak uh, low-level jet case, which had you know, much stronger um, instability, you see that we actually have a long, a long range of scales over which a beta is, uh, is about five-thirds, but then two things happen. Uh, in the model that are interesting. First of all, we see the same behavior either at 1.2 kilometers as, as we see it at six kilometers. But then we see that in the transition here, in the, in the, in the higher resolution uh, the domain, we actually see non-physical behavior in terms of the scaling of the model results. And this is really a concern, and, and as I'll point uh, the south later, this scale at which this break occurs actually varies in time, and so varies with regime. What this is pointing out is that we have to be very careful at how we look at models and what we think the effective resolution of the model is. Here in this case, you see this is about um, also uh, uh, the five-thirds, but in this case, in, in, in the latitude uh, uh, direction, we have about 2.0. And this is also consistent with having a strong low-level jet case where we have very strong organization in the, in the north-south uh, direction. Now, if you do this for the, uh, the total water, we find exactly the same behavior. And here what we added on top, these are uh, brightness uh, temperatures, actually infra, uh, infrared data over the same region at the same time. And so what it shows is that uh, the satellite data is basically really behaving as you would expect in terms, or the model is behaving as what is being observed in, uh, in the satellite data. Again, the same sort of unphysical behavior. Of course, all of these results are for ensemble means, but you can look at any instant in the simulation and you find basically the same behavior. So uh, a convective uh, versus a non-convective uh, regime, and we see that this effective resolution of the model over which the scaling is actually preserved is varying, is varying over time. Now, if we look at this then in terms of, for example, C1 versus uh, simple parameters that are indication of what's going on in terms of instability, for example, the maximum vertical velocity, what you see is, uh, 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 this is for kinetic energy, this is for the total water, you see that our E-dry, which is basically our very uh, nothing is happening, non-convective type of case, is, uh, is very uh, much all the same, <laughs> all the time in the, same, uh, in the same position. Whereas in the case of the other two, uh, uh, the two simulations, we see a strong variation, which actually has a diurnal cycle. Now, if we look at this in terms of beta, we see also the same behavior, but in this case, we're looking at the diurnal cycle. And so we do see this kind of change from over time of uh, uh, the different uh, um, uh, simulations. And again, you know, very similar type of behavior as we, uh, as we, lo as, as we look at, uh, at the dependence with, uh, with vertical um, uh, velocity. So the idea then was, well, if this is true, then we should be able to explore this consistency of behavior between the coarse scales and the small scales to help us understand, for example, what happens in terms of cloud fraction. And for those of you who do atmospheric modeling and know this is one of the big, of the big questions in terms of, uh, of subgrid uh, scale representation of, uh, of moist processes is how to actually represent uh, 
the cloud fraction as we go from the coarser scales into the, into the smaller scales, and this has implication for how latent heating is, is distributed and, uh, and so on. So one of the well-known um, the parameterizations is by Bonnie and, uh, and, uh, and Emmanuel, and it was published in, in, in 2001, and what they proposed at the time was to use a log normal distribution, uh, um, a PDF, and so basically uh, use that as a, as a reference. So what we did here was to use a multifractal downscaling, as we, ha we have done before, uh, for rainfall and so on. And, and we have here, this is for all simulations, so for the non-convective regime, both convective regimes, and the red lines are for uh, the, the, uh, the convective uh, instance uh, during the simulation, and that the blue lines are for the non-convective. And so what you'll see is that as you look at uh, the total water distribution, we have, uh, these are the, are the model results which we are considering the truth in this case. <laughs> and so we're, we're downscaling in here, it's, it's a simple downscaling from six kilometers, so, so from, from our domain two to our domain one at one kilometer. And as you can see, our distributions using this method basically fit in perfectly for both regimes, or almost perfectly in all cases, the actual uh, the cloud fraction simulated in our domain one. Now this needs more exploring, but it's very rewarding to see that we can actually do this without having to run the model at one kilometer and obtain a very consistent um, statistical distribution. Now, some of the big challenges, and I think the previous speaker <laughs> gave an outstanding talk about issues of, uh, of uh, you know, vertical scaling, issues of stability, how do we deal with, with analysis uh, of, those, uh, of those processes. And then other, other issues for us uh, that are also important is, are, are, are these issues of hyper-resolution and, and really understanding the physics that go with it, because we sort of oftentimes forget as we increase model resolution that the physics, uh, 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 that we have highly parameterized physics. And so, and so uh, things happen that should not be happening and, uh, and we need to, to really keep numerics and physics and, uh, and spatial resolution all in mind at, uh, at the same time. Now thinking about this vertical uh, a resolution issue. This is uh, uh, from a paper uh, by Pressel and Bill Collins in Journal of Climate uh, the, using AIRS data. And uh, you know what you can get from AIRS is basically information about water vapor distribution in the atmosphere. And what they found, they did a very interesting analysis looking at ascending and uh, descending orbits and basically looking at, at the scaling factor at, at different levels in the atmosphere. And what they found, I didn't want to take that. What did I do? Okay, this. What they found, they actually came up with this vertical structure for water vapor that is pretty fascinating. Now, this is away from the tropics, so it's, it's away from uh, minus 20 and and the 20 degrees in latitude, and it's all over the ocean, so it's not over land, but it's remarkable that you can actually find this type of, uh, of a vertical organization and climatology uh, 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 from these data. So now look at the variability from uh, the different types of orbits and so on, and so understanding observations and what we are actually looking at uh, in terms of these, uh, of these uh, uh, data sets is very important. I just wanted um, to show you this and I'll, f and I'll finish. This is the issue that I was talking about in terms of the physics and resolution. And uh, uh, this is analysis we've done using a Lyapunov exponents and looking at instabilities, moist instabilities in, in cloudiness. And here we're comparing ESCIP data with NAR, which is a reanalysis product. And what you can see is that very different behavior at small scales. And so basically the observations are way looser and way faster uh, and, uh, and unconstrained as compared to what the models are doing in reanalysis especially. It's almost like it's under, under, under uh, a vest. And so this has implications on how we represent 
uh, the turbulence, cloud fraction, cloud processes, and so on. More importantly, even though they look very similar here, they actually have very different memory characteristics. So we see that the time scale, for example, of these, of these smaller but low frequency instabilities are, uh, yeah. are you know, large but low frequency instabilities are actually very different in, uh, in the two. So these are the kinds of issues that, for example, what makes a good data simulation? Can we actually preserve the statistics of these, of memory and, uh, and, uh, and instability? And so, you know, that's the big challenge, I think. Thank you. Any questions for Anna? Yeah, please. Sorry. Oh, I should be able to do this better, right? Than this. This one? Yes, I, I did not understand what was green and red, etc. So basically what we did here was we took, thank you for asking the question because I rushed through it. So what we did here was we took uh, the reanalysis data and we look at cloudiness, uh, water vapor uh, and clouds. <coughs> and so at each pixel, this is actually not uh, fully space time, it's just in time. So at each location, we did the Lyapunov exponent analysis. And, uh, and then we did the same with the ESCIP data. And, you know, really there's lots of modifications that are done in terms of the satellite data until you get a product like ISKI. Now, the reason why we picked uh, this product specifically was because the spatial scale are very similar. So NAR and ISKI are both at about 30 kilometer resolution. And so, and so we did this actually as a function of season, a diurnal cycles, and so on, and we focused in the southeast US. We were just interested in looking at, uh, at some of the assumptions uh, uh, that are made in the models. And so, for example, one of the concerns with NAR is that they <coughs> use specified SST. And so what you see, this, uh, this uh, different behavior here of, uh, of these instabilities in terms of the, of the longer time scales at about, say, a monthly to seasonal and so on, you know, that comes from the fact that uh, 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 they are specifying SST as opposed to actually having it evolving naturally. Now, in this case here, we did some careful analysis, and what you see is that at, at the very small perturbations, we, we see that they don't grow very fast in the model at all, and in part, this is because of the parameterizations themselves. The concern is so big that things will not blow up, <laughs> and uh, you know, that everything is damped. And so another thing that we see that's very, you know, very critical is uh, the effect of the mountains. So clearly the mountains were so concerned about getting the mountains right that then we force it very hard. And, uh, and so you see that over the mountains, you see this, this really excessive, uh, um, um, you know, constraining of the system. Thank you. <laughs> One more question, anybody? Maybe just very quickly, you keep, uh, you refer all the time to the cloud fraction, and of course, from a scaling point of view, is not the right concept because, right, it's, it's not got the right dimension, but I suppose it's actually just a tunable parameter, the sub No, it's, it's not a tunable parameter, actually, well, we didn't, um, what it is in our, in, our, in our calculations is basically over the size of the grid, you know, the fraction of the grid that would be occupied by condensate okay. of the volume of the grid. Okay, so it's, it could be a bit problematic from a scaling viewpoint then because it, it was just at one scale. Okay, all right. Yeah, no, no, and, and we're doing, in, in the cases when we're doing that, we're actually doing you know, the full uh, 3D integration of all the variables. Okay. Actually, so we, we have sort of a, of, a vertical in, of a vertical information there that shouldn't, you know, quite mm -hmm. be there. Okay. But. okay, well, thank you very much. Now, uh, go on to our, the last talk in this, uh, before the coffee break, not of the session, but before the coffee break, uh, Francois Schmidt, 
will talk about scales and scaling in turbulent ocean sciences, physics, biology, coupling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So thank you for uh, proposing me to uh, speak to this uh, session. So I'm going to speak about uh, scales and uh, scaling in uh, turbulent ocean sciences. Um, so I, I come from the uh, laboratory of uh, oceanology and uh, geosciences, which is uh, situated in the north of France in the English uh, Channel, which, which I'm, you can see the lab here. So my uh, topic uh, today, first I will speak about, uh, give a general introduction about uh, turbulence and uh, uh, marine ecology, and then I will speak about uh, two uh, topics, uh, doing a kind of uh, overview of what has been done, uh, more or less in the field of turbulence, scaling and phytoplankton, and also uh, scaling turbulence and zooplankton. And then I will speak about bio, uh, geochemical time series and the problem of the mixing of uh, stochastics and deterministic uh, forcing. So for turbulence and marine ecology, so we have, uh, like in other fields, we have uh, in the ocean a huge range of uh, scales which are excited. And uh, if we look at uh, organisms, uh, marine organisms, they also uh, uh, belong to different uh, scales, from very small to, uh, to, uh, to a few meters. And also this corresponds to, uh, to the turbulence uh, realm and also to the viscous realm. So globally, uh, since the session is speaking about complexity, uh, marine food webs really belong to uh, complex systems. You have uh, predator-prey dynamics, you have uh, population dynamics, you have a huge influence of turbulence. And uh, to simplify, you can say that some animals, we call, it, we call them benthic animals, they live uh, uh, attached to the bottom, and they see the world in an Eulerian, uh, Eulerian way. Whereas uh, planktonic animals see the world in a Lagrangian way. So in bo both cases, in fact, turbulence is very important. So it's a multi-scale problem. So uh, we are going to speak about the scales. And uh, we also, in some cases, have uh, superposition. And especially uh, true in the ocean, uh, you have uh, some forcing, some astronomic forcing, which is uh, deterministic. So with tidal, daily, and annual cycles. And uh, there is a nice citation here, no life without water and no life in water without turbulence. So globally, uh, if we go back uh, to a Navier-Stokes equation, uh, which can be written for an element of fluid, so the, the correct scale if we want to deal with Navier-Stokes equation is really the, the very small scales. And you have also the transport equation, uh, which uh, applies to a chemical quantity, which can be, in our case, phyt phytoplankton, salinity, temperature, and other fields. And in, in, in many cases, we need also to add, uh, in, in the transport equation, uh, here, chemical or biological reactions. But the main problem, of course, if we want to do, uh, uh, to solve numerically, uh, Navier-Stokes equation uh, using the, what is called uh, in the field of turbulence uh, direct numerical simulation. That is with the present time uh, computer power, you need uh, more or less the age of the universe to uh, simulate uh, something with a Reynolds number of the order of 10 to the 9, which is uh, more or less the uh, Reynolds number uh, of uh, the global uh, ocean. So this is not possible. And some people are doing some models, so they are uh, averaging, so they assume that the average of reality at a, at a large scale is the same as a, a kind of average of Navier-Stokes of the average. So they say the average re of reality is the same as model of average. Of course, we know that is not uh, true because you have uh, the so-called uh, turbulent closure problem, so you need to express fluxes at a large scale, and we don't know how to express this. And this belongs to the famous uh, seven uh, problems of the Clay Mathematical Institute, where you can win uh, uh, so, some dollars if you uh, are able to solve it. And you can see here that it's still unsolved. So since it's not solved, 
And since, uh, in my point of view, the models which are proposed, uh, we cannot trust them because of this closure, this strong, very strong closure problem. So we need to uh, use other ways to, uh, to deal with this uh, type of, uh, of fields. And one way, one possible way is to follow uh, a path which has been proposed uh, uh, by uh, Richardson and Kolmogorov using phenomenological law uh, scaling relations. And now the continuation of this is more or less more mathematical, where we use multiplicative cascades, probability theory, uh, scaling uh, stochastic process, and multifractal fields. So I will uh, make a, a short overview of uh, what uh, has been done in the field of scaling, turbulence, and marine ecology. So I go back to the framework, which is uh, uh, very classical with uh, Kolmogorov 41 um, uh, theory and uh, so you, in this framework in the inertial range uh, velocity fluctuation uh, have a statistical universality with a power law of one third. Uh, you have a Kolmogorov scale which comes out and which separates turbulent and viscous scales and uh, so below you are in the viscous world and above you are in the turbulence. It's more or less the order of millimeter, depending on the value of uh, epsilon, so the epsilon which is a dissipation. So in the coastal ocean, in fact, uh, the Kolmogorov scale is smaller than in the open ocean linked to the value of, uh, of uh, epsilon. And this, when we, we do uh, marine uh, ecological studies, is important because uh, in fact, when we deal with very small animals, we need to know if they are below or above also the Kolmogorov scale. Because in some cases, they live in a viscous world and it's not the same to, to swim in a viscous world. So the general framework is to uh, deal with uh, cascade from large to small scales. And uh, also we have uh, the same relation in uh, Fourier space with the famous, uh, famous uh, five-third uh, power law in Fourier space. And for this, you have the same for passive scalars, where five-third uh, power law were found also for the scaling uh, uh, in the Fourier space or one-third in, uh, in real space. So this, was, this is a general uh, theoretical framework to deal with uh, animals and uh, with uh, organisms. So here, if, if we speak about phytoplankton, it's small scales, which are, if you, if you see here, it's below uh, the Kolmogorov scale. So one idea, which uh, if we go back in the 70s, one idea was to uh, compare uh, phytoplankton concentration with a passive scala. So this was recorded by using a fluorescence uh, device and this was a proxy of a phytoplankton concentration. And some uh, scaling laws here, you have the log-log plot of the power spectrum, where you have uh, more or less uh, roughly uh, five third uh, scaling. So we did also some work in this topic uh, in uh, the 90s, where we uh, considered the simultaneous measurement of temperature and fluorescence, and we compared, in fact, the statistics in a multifractal framework of uh, phytoplankton and uh, temperature. Temperature was taken as a passive scala in this case. So here, in, an example of uh, the series of temperature and fluorescence and also the power spectra which are found. And uh, we uh, also did intermittency analysis in, in uh, these different regimes. So the uh, general message was to say that in this case, we have uh, uh, statistics which are similar for uh, uh, phytoplankton and, uh, and temperature at uh, small scales. So, in fact, uh, we, we uh, interpreted this as saying that physics dominates at small scales. And then at uh, larger scales, we have biology which dominates. And the transition scale of uh, 20 seconds was uh, considered to be uh, a, a typical scale where, in fact, biology begins to be important. So we have also some scaling uh, studies which have been done in uh, using satellite image by uh, doing some uh, uh, adequate algorithms. So chlorophyll can be estimated uh, from uh, satellite uh, products. And here it's an example using a MODIS uh, satellite image. Uh, there are several studies looking in this case at the scaling properties in, uh, in 2D by doing different uh, scaling methodologies. Uh, like power spectrum and also intermittency analysis. 
Uh, here the, I give several references in, in uh, the last 15 years using such methodology to, to characterize uh, chlorophyll. So if we go uh, here, we are in the very large scale with uh, uh, satellite. We can also go to, very, to the very small scale by uh, considering phytoplankton. And in this case, you have uh, some studies by, uh, consider that consider the phytoplankton motility, which is a very interesting uh, property of uh, several uh, of these uh, families of uh, phytoplankton. So they are able to swim with, with a swimming velocity of uh, 0.2 to 0.5 uh, millimeter per second, and it's important for their ecology. <coughs> so they have different ways to move. So uh, it depends on the mechanism, in fact, which you use for them for the motility. So they can uh, look to, to oxygen concentration, to concentration gradient of a given quantity, like food, uh, to uh, swim towards light. Uh, answer a current, and also some studies considered uh, gyrotaxis, so they're swimming against gravity, which is important because their density is slightly larger than uh, the water, so they are going to, uh, to sink, and they need to be able to, uh, to, to, to stay uh, close to the light. So it was uh, tested in some studies experimentally and also simulated because it's a uh, mechanism uh, quite easy to simulate in a direct numerical simulation. So here uh, I, I put some, uh, just one example of uh, a study uh, which has appeared last year, uh, where some phytoplankton uh, which, uh, of this species, which is shown here, and having the property to be uh, gyrotactic, uh, was uh, put in a system, in a rotating system, so they, it uh, sends, in fact, uh, acceleration as a gravity, so it's uh, trying to uh, swim against acceleration. And uh, if you have dead cells, it's homogeneous. If you have living cells, you have a given pattern. And it was uh, reproduced using direct numerical simulation. Okay, so some uh, also uh, going uh, even to smaller scales, as there are some studies looking at the bacterium motility in relation with the uh, turbulence. I, I put here only an example, which was uh, which appeared uh, in uh, uh, three years ago, and it was a review paper looking at the in fact ma marine microbes. In, uh, they uh, mentioned uh, to, uh, marine microbes in a sea of gradients, and the gradients are produced by different organisms. And uh, in fact, they have a, a whole world in here to, uh, to explore and to look at the, the, the variability, uh, even at these uh, small, very small scales. So there are not so many studies in this field. I just uh, gave a few examples. So if we go to a zooplankton, um, one interesting uh, concept to consider zooplankton is the particle uh, Reynolds number. So you uh, compute the Reynolds number by taking the swimming velocity, the size of the organism, and uh, if it's uh, much larger than one, it's swimming in a turbulent world, and smaller than one in a viscous world. So uh, by looking at the literature, I compiled uh, um, uh, the, this particle Reynolds number for many different organisms, going from, my, uh, for, from bacteria to whales. So we have seven order of magnitude uh, for the size of the particles and 13 order of magnitude for uh, the Reynolds number. And we can, uh, so here you have uh, silate, uh, bacteria, you have the human here, the whale, the fish, and you have a very nice scaling uh, relation with a slope 1.86, which is uh, interesting also to see is that you can cross, in fact, the turbulent to viscous world with the same scaling law. So, um, uh, so this was in, uh, for, for concern, concerning uh, a, Reynolds number, a particle Reynolds number close to one. Uh, it was used uh, by several uh, studies, in fact, to, to um, consider, in fact, copepods, which are small crustaceans of the order of one millimeter. And uh, they are saying that they use the advantage of living in the border of two worlds because they use low Reynolds number properties for feeding 
and a large Reynolds number uh, properties for uh, escaping uh, predators. So it's um, here you, uh, you you find this uh, relation with uh, you have the, the Reynolds number close to one for a size of 0 0.6 millimeters. So uh, I oh yeah I wanted also to mention that the 1.86 uh, scaling law I found is uh, was uh, already given by Okubo in a paper in 87 where using the literature this time he found also the same and. Uh, by doing, I, I did a, a power law fitting with no a priori, and I found exactly the same uh, scaling relations. So, uh, but of course, we don't have for the moment any uh, theoretical uh, uh, interpretation of this uh, 1.86 uh, exponent. So now I go to um, the last uh, part: uh, biogeochemical uh, coastal time series. So in fact, here we are in the framework of uh, complex and multi-scale fluctuation in oceanography. So we need high frequency sampling and also good methodology to deal with this. I, I, I have here different examples showing uh, dissolved oxygen, pH fluctuations, uh, temperature and velocity. So they are more or less uh, turbulent-like. We, if we are used to uh, deal with turbulent fluctuation, we can see that uh, it looks like uh, turbulence. So we can use the turbulent tools, in fact, to try to analyze this. Um, so we have stochastic variability on a large range of scales. Uh, also, some deterministic periods, like uh, tidal or uh, daily cycles and many missing data which are linked to fooling, to the fact that you need to clean the systems, and sometimes there are some failure in the system. Here, an example with the uh, oxygen series. If you uh, zoom in, in a small part here, you see many interruptions. And delta T here is a time between two measurements, and we can see that you have a failure at many different scales. So in fact, we need to use the uh, uh, methodology taking into account the fact that we have mi many missing data. So I'm here uh, proposing the, a method which is called uh, arbitrary order Hilbert spectral analysis. So I'm saying a few words about this method. So it's a new uh, method which was proposed by Norden Wang in uh, 98. It's a way to decompose a signal into a sum of modes and each mode uh, is localized in frequency space, so it will uh, pro provide a filter bank for analyzing the series. So it was proposed in this paper here, which, uh, which belonged to the field of uh, physical oceanography. It was uh, proposed for analyzing water waves, but seen, since uh, then it uh, was used by hundreds of uh, studies in many different fields and received uh, 4, 000, more than 4,000 citations. But still, there is no mathematical uh, result for this method. So it's, in fact, it's an algorithm. You, the algorithm is to, uh, to estimate uh, local extrema and minimum, then taking uh, the, the average of it, extracting a detail, and then iterating uh, with a stopping criteria. Then you, at the end, the original signal is written as a sum of modes and a residue and the norm, how many modes do we need, in fact, is uh, more or less linked to log two of the number of points. So globally, we don't have so, ma so many modes. And each mode, in fact, is uh, given by the data itself and not by a, a priori assumption, like in Fourier of wavelet framework. So the method is uh, illustrated here by taking, for example, from the Flandrin ENS Lyon webpage, you have a time series, you uh, estimate the um, local maximum, you take a spline uh, interpolation, then you take the local minimum, uh, interpolate, take the average of it, subtract, and then iterate. Uh, at the end, you obtain the um, decomposition, like here, where in this case, you have 10 modes, and uh, you have the residue in the bottom here, and uh, each mode has a given frequency. So the, the first mode is a high frequency, then you, you decrease the, the fre typical frequency. And the original time series is the sum of all these uh, modes. So there is a second step, which is a Hilbert-Wong algorithm. So each mode, which is here, uh, is uh, Hilbert-transformed, and then you construct um, 
so-called analytical signal by using the uh, here the Hilbert part and here the mode, and then this complex number is in fact uh, has a given uh, amplitude and a given phase, and if you derivate the phase, you have a, a frequency. So it's in fact a local time frequency amplitude and analysis method. And by doing this, you can estimate a 2D PDF of the frequency and the amplitude. And using this PDF, you can do some, uh, so, some averaging and uh, taking the square, the, the, the square of the amplitude, you obtain a, spectra, a power spectrum. Here an example, using uh, turbulence, uh, you have uh, a turbulent time series, you have the Fourier power spectrum and the Hilbert one, and you have five such scaling in both cases. This also, it, it's a method we decompose uh, as a dyadic filter box. It means the characteristic frequency is more or less uh, half the frequency of the previous mode. And also each mode is more or less localized in the Fourier space, as can be shown here. So we, what we proposed uh, a few years ago was to, uh, de to uh, generalize this method by taking the, a moment of order Q of the amplitude here. And this uh, was a way to, uh, to study also the intermittency property of scaling uh, time series. So it was a way uh, to do alternative uh, method to uh, the structure function classical method. And we obtained a, a power law scaling exponent here, which is related to the one of the uh, uh, structure function. So it was a way to characterize intermittency in a process even if we have uh, missing data. And also, uh, if we have a, a forcing at a given characteristic scale. So, an example here for this forcing, we did a simulation where we added artificially a periodic function. So, if you look at the spectrum, you can see it's perturbating by a pike here. And uh, the structure function method is completely destroyed. The scaling of the structure function is completely destroyed by this method, whereas the Hilbert approach uh, is not too much perturbed. So in fact, it's a way to, to, to say that when we have uh, um, a stochastic uh, variability superposed to a strong deterministic forcing, which is often the case in the ocean, uh, we have a nice method here to, which is able to extract uh, the, the scaling exponents. So I give here two examples uh, very quickly. Uh, one is a water level time series, the other one is a biogeochemical time series. So the water level is a superposition of a one hour resolution of model and measurement. The model, is, the superposition is shown here. They're very close to each other because it's the tidal elevation of the sea. So the model seems to be very nice, but if you subtract the two, then you have the residue and the residue uh, can reach uh, two meters in some cases, and uh, if it happens when you have a high tide, then you have a, a, a flood surge and a coastal flood like uh, it appears in some cases. And um, if you look at the power spectrum in two cases, you can see that the model in fact is reproducing the pikes, which corresponds to the tidal range and the harmonics here, and, uh, but it's very bad for low, order, low, low frequency. And so uh, what is the difference is that, in fact, the, um, the, the deterministic part is given by the astronomy and the stochastic part is given by the metallurgy. Metallurgy being, in this case, low pressure or temperature or winds and a mixture of all this. And all this is producing this uh, scaling uh, behavior for low frequency, which is found here with a slope 1.45. So with a very high pike we have here, it's not easy to extract and to characterize the stochastic part. And uh, the structure function, of course, cannot work. Using the Hilbert method, we could extract the different moments scaling here, and then extract the, the moment function, nonlinear moment function, which is a classical zeta of Q function, which is here nicely uh, nonlinear. So uh, another... Um, Last example, using biogeochemical uh, monitoring. So this was done by uh, automatic monitoring uh, uh, given by uh, some colleagues from IFREMER. And uh, so I'm uh, considering here dissolved oxygen and fluorescence time series, which are shown here. And uh, using uh, the Hilbert method, uh, we could find a H value, so it's Earth's exponent uh, of 0 0.4 and 0 0.5. 
with uh, here tidal influence and daily influence. We have one day here and here very nice scaling range of a given range between uh, one day and one year. And so we could extract the same, uh, doing some uh, uh, Hilbert uh, generalized moments, also extracting the moment function and seeing that fluorescence is more intermittent than dissolved oxygen. We have the two nonlinear curve here. So that was two examples showing the, the method uh, in uh, different, uh, for different time series. And as a conclusion, so this method is able to uh, analyze the nonlinear non stationary time series, uh, working when we have missing data, and also when we have uh, strong uh, deterministic forcing. And uh, doing some uh, to, to finish, if it works. Okay, and to finish, uh, some advertisement for a book which is in press about this uh, methodology. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you Francois. So we have some time for questions. Yes, please. Oh, it's, you have a similar decomposition, but the main difference is that in the wavelet approach, you, are, you have a basis function, which is, uh, uh, you, you know the, each uh, scale, and with this method, you have a modulation frequency and amplitude, uh, amplitude modulation and frequency modulation, which is possible. So you, you can write similar way to decompose a signal, but uh, still some difference because of this uh, property. Yes. Um, can you attribute the difference in how it's between the uh, fluorescence and the dissolved oxygen to some physics difference in physics? Where does it come from? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, we don't know for the moment. We, yeah, of course, it should be, uh, <coughs> it's the objective is to be able to understand where, how, from what it comes from and also to give a theoretical explanation. Yeah. Yes, please. This uh, one, uh, the method seems to do a detending of, of the data. Would you recommend how to compress the detending methods? Yeah, it, it can be used for detending, then you need only the first part of the method, which is empirical mode decomposition. If you choose uh, some uh, modes and you add different modes with, uh, 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 without choosing one of the modes, then you can do a kind of detending, yeah, or denoising or detending. I think uh, it's, uh, yeah, for the trending, I, I, I'm not sure it's the, the, the best property. It works like other methods, but of course we have also other methods that can detrend uh, time series. But uh, it's nicely detrending, but uh, yeah. Are there other questions? The The, uh, the modes are uh, experimentally almost orthogonal, but they are not orthogonal by, uh, I mean, the hypothesis of the method. And uh, so it's uh, the result of the algorithm that they are almost orthogonal. And uh, it doesn't work for all series. If you take something looking like uh, the rain, small scale rainfall with many zeros, or uh, the epsilon dissipation field, something like this, uh, it doesn't work. So it's, it's not working on all series. And uh, that I, we don't know why, uh, we don't know a criterion saying that it will work or not on a given series. And I think, um, yeah, there is no mathematical result up to now on this. Because maybe in the same line, I mean, surely somebody has, or should be done is to, to check uh, on, say, multifractal numerical you know, simulations where you know the, all the statistics and then you see, compare this method to other methods and... Oh, we did this, yeah. And yeah. you did it, yeah, so you did it and what, what was your result then? It, yeah, it work, it's working. And yeah, it gives, yeah. is it better, worse than other methods or same? Um, or what's the, we did this with log normal simulations and uh, so we know the parameters we put inside and look at the method of what they give back and it was slightly better than the structure function. Okay. 
Any other questions before we have a coffee break? Okay, so we should reconvene in about 25 minutes for the second part of the um, session. All right, so I think we should indeed start. Um, for the first talk on this block, I'd like to introduce Peter Ditlivsen, who will talk about scaling in the climate, non-universality, and climate states. Uh, thank you, Peter. So uh, what I thought I would do in this was give you some very simple uh, thoughts on uh, time series that we have in climate and how they scale, and that's, that's mainly with with time and how much we get out of that. And, and I guess it goes back to the uh, sort of uh, very simple way of treating this system. Now we've heard this morning about turbulence. And of course, we know a lot of scaling relations there. Uh, the, the, the temporal spectrum would be sort of minus five thirds. That didn't work very well. Oh, let's probably this one. Into me. Okay. But here, on, on, on longer time scales, we have a system that we, of course, imagine could be described by you know, slow variables and fast variables. And uh, going back to the ideas of Hasselmann and so on, we would treat the slow variables as, as stochastic. And that sort of, in some sense, trivializes everything to a, 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 a in this case, a linear einstein ulmberg process here. But actually, it works pretty well. If you look at, at sort of standard measurements, this is from the Atlantic Ocean, an old, old, uh, old analysis uh, measurements um, along the lines of, uh, of Frankie Noe and Hasselmann, and uh, this is from the 70s, that if you look at the power spectrum, it actually fits pretty well what you'd get out of an einstein ulmberg process here. If you take data, paleo data that we believe goes further back in time, you could do more or less the same. This is from a, um, this is from an ice core that I'll be talking a lot about. And this is the whole scene record of, of the ice core, the power spectrum, and it also, also pretty much uh, fits the, the linear thing. So in some sense, it's boring. You have more in the ice core here. This is the annual peak. It's not very pronounced, and that's simply because dating is an issue in, 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 in paleo records. But of course, we know there should be an annual peak like that. And there's more to it, of course, than the, than the stochastic variability. We also have, uh, have linear response to things. So this is the record that I showed the, uh, the, uh, the power spectrum from. Now uh, I have to apologize that I'll be jumping from having time going in, in, in one or the other direction. But now this is time in the right direction. So we're starting here at minus 9,000 years. This it's actually called the 8.2 event. That's a cold spell during the whole scene. And then we go back here. So the variability that we saw, so sort of linearly you would think, would be the, uh, uh, the deviations from this mean that seems to have a trend here. But this red curve is actually not the mean of, of the curve. This is the insulation curve from 65 north. So this is a... some. Uh, a proxy for a northern uh, uh, Atlantic temperature, and it pretty much follows linearly the, um, the astronomic forcing here. So we have a, 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 a we will think, a, a deterministic part and a stochastic part. We can go back further in time, and uh, so if we were to hint cast, we would, of course, guess that, that we would follow back in time like that. Now the ice core is much longer than the Holocene, and uh, this is how it looks. And it's way from a uh, linear uh, response to that. So there's much more going on. Uh, so just to set your eyes right, this is the transition from the glacial period to the, uh, to the uh, Holocene, our present climate. This is called the, uh, the Younger Dryas, uh, Berling Alroy, Younger Dryas cooling. And we go back in time, and these that I'll be talking about as well are the Danske Øsker events. They have been discovered in, in ice cores. Uh, they've been afterwards seen in, 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 in sediment cores and, and, uh, and stalagmite cores and things like that. 
they were not predicted by any theory. Uh, you run a climate model for a thousand, for a trillion years, and you wouldn't find out how climate actually was. So there's more to it than, than the linear response. So what I want to do is to actually look at the part of the spectrum that is not sort of well known. Of course, we have the, uh, the year and the day, and this is, this is the old graph from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Michel in, in the 70s, and, and it, actually Sean brought it to my attention recently, that there's something here with the continuum, the background that's not really uh, very structured, and perhaps there's structure in there that we have to, to consider. So let's just put it in a different scale here, and say so if, if, if we had a red noise spectrum, as we should have, it would look something like that. So this is sort of what Sean quotes the, the, the missing quadrillion, in the sense that, 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 that on this axis here, uh, there's a big difference. Of course, I guess we should take it a little bit uh, uh, sort of loosely, because you know, having having a spectrum up here, we would have temperature variations of millions of degrees, which we, of course, didn't have. If this is temperature, that would be the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, how does this come about? Of course, it comes about by gluing together uh, spectra, so we have to have some sort of, of, of understanding of that. And another, oh, that's annoying that this one comes up all the time. No, no, I'm, I'm not. It's, it's the ETU that comes up with the, uh, ask me to, oh, or maybe if we turn off the uh, wireless, turn off the wireless. Uh, uh, so where's that? Where's that, where's that? Here, it's, uh, where where's that bar up here? I think I accepted it and then it should be okay. Okay, we'll, we'll just continue. I'm sorry for this. So, Here's another one here for, by, by Huybers and Curry. Uh, it's basically the same, but what you see here, what is characteristic about the, uh, say, the temperature record and so on, is that we actually do have a, a big contrast to turbulence. We do not exactly have a connection between time scales and spatial scales and so on. In terms of temperature, you see the annual peak here. It's about the same order as the red noise uh, where it turns, maybe turns white at, at, uh, at uh, 10,000 years here. So, so it's, it's sort of the, this thinking that the you know, difference between day and night is about 10 degrees, difference between summer and winter is about 10 degrees, difference between a glacial and an interglacial is about 10 degrees. So it's a very different uh, beast than, the, than, than turbulence would give. So let's see how much we could do about that. Let's, first of all, let's see what would be the kind of data that we'll look through these six orders of magnitude. This is a, this is a temperature record from Europe, and we have about uh, 100 years, and it, it looks nice. And actually, the little blue ones you see here, that's the annual cycle. And that's, of course, enormous in comparison to the variations, sort of the stochastic variations we have going here. So just in order to see this, this uh, uh, anomaly from the annual cycle, it's, it's put on a different scale, okay? Then we can go further back with the ice core that I sh record, that's the same record I showed you before, with this top blue just put on, on the, 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 uh, the end here, assuming the same scaling. This is of course a proxy, it's not a temperature, it's a proxy for temperature, it just put it on the same scale. And we go back another 10,000 years. Okay. We could go even further back into the glacial period. That's the other one I showed you. And you see this nice, calm climate we have in the Holocene is very different here in the glacial. And we can go even further back in Antarctica, lower resolution, but we could go about 800,000 years back. And you see one glacial cycle after the other. I should go the right way in time here. These are glacial cycles and so on. And that we can actually glue with, uh, with sediment cores from the ocean and go back another uh, five million years. And you see pretty much uh, uh, an overlap here, uh, well found overlap all the way through here. What you see in this record here are other changes 
from in the periodicity from this part of the record to that part of the record. Now we can do the, 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 the spectral uh, analysis and, and we get the same spectrum here, right? That's the spectra on top of each other of all those curves. So it looks like a nice thing, but what you do see are scale breaks. And these scale breaks are important. We have sort of a flat, uh, flat curve here up to about 100 years or so, and then we have a, a red noise with, and we've been quoting a lot of different uh, numbers here. This red line is 1.4. I think we have everything going from, from that to two. The point is that this beta here is not trivial. Had it been two, it would have been trivial, right? So that means that we have more in there than, than the simple model does. But let me just do something very simple now. Let's do a spatial cut here and see what, what that is in the record here. And that's, of course, just a linear analysis that we can take the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the black, which is the ice core, well-dated uh, N-grip ice core here, and we can simply make a, a high pass, a low pass and a high pass, so that uh, the full record here on top is just this uh, low pass and this high pass added. So this is sort of old stuff that we did back in the 90s. Uh, so what you see here, actually putting a little imagination on, you will see that all these uh, climate shifts, the Dansk Oeska events, are in this part of the spectrum, right? While the fast fluctuations here, which would be, say, El Nino uh, timescales and, 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 and shorter timescales, are in there. But there's a lot of structure in this uh, part of the, the signal as well. The most striking thing is that uh, it sort of follows the very slow changes in climate going into the last glacial maximum going up here. You see that in the envelope here, that the variance, the intensity of the noise here is it's very insisting, this thing. <laughs> but now we know what to do. Okay. Um, they follow each other, right? So somehow the climate state here is different from the climate state over here, as we also saw in the, in the, in, in, in the spectra. Uh, so let's just look at that in a little more detail by chopping out the Holocene record. This is this part where the noise is sort of stationary here. And the last glacial maximum, which is a period here where this noise is sort of uh, stationary as well. So let's look at that in a little more detail uh, up here. And what you see is that the Holocene record is boring in the sense that, that, that it, it has a Gaussian shape here, more or less Gaussian. It's hard to see it should be anything but Gaussian here. But if you look at the last glacial maximum here, it really has long tails in the distribution. So it's a more intermittent part of the signal. Of course, that, that, from that you could speculate that, that that's really what's driving the, 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 the fluctuations in and out of these dansk oeska events, uh, that you can do that. So this is one thing you can do, okay? So, what you could also do, uh, instead of looking at, the, uh, at the, the full power spectrum, which of course takes the information from the whole thing, you could chop it up, you could do wavelet or... In this case, we do a detrended fluctuation analysis, which is a very, I mean, it's a very simple and simple-minded thing, going back to Hearst, which uh, you probably have heard of. The idea is you chop up your data here. Now, the integrated data, but that's, that's, that's just a technicality here. Uh, chop it up. In this case, I chop this one up into two bytes, okay? I subtract, uh, say, the trend. I could subtract a polynomial of some degree, then it would be a DFA of some degree, but this is just, say, DFA 1, which means that I subtract this one, represented by that, and then I just calculate, and that's then the green curve, and then I calculate the, uh, the variance, right? So now I get a, a variance that's, that depends on the size of my window and, and uh, which window number I have, V. So I have V1 here and V2 there, okay? So I can do that. But I can do more. I could also do it looking for multifractality. I could simply look at the statistics of this thing here by 
uh, summing it up over all the windows here into the qth power, taking it into the one, one over q. And the point is that I see a scaling relation here. So that's sort of the old scaling relation going back to Hurst, more or less. But in this case, in the full multifractal uh, framework, and I get this sort of generalized Hurst exponent here of the order q, q. Okay, so let's do that on these data. And what we get with the same color coding as, as always, so this is, this is the same power spectrum that I, I showed before. But now you see for the fast time scales here, you have one scaling relation here that actually goes from all the way down from sort of weather uh, regimes uh, here. Can you see the red spot at all? Well, I can, but anyway. Um, through the Holocene, but a different scaling in the glacial. But what you also see here is a scale break. This is the scale break here around uh, 10,000 years or something like that. And that's actually important or maybe a little surprising here that you, you go to sort of a, a what, what you'd call in this sense a trivial scaling here, A is equal uh, uh, one half corresponding to white noise, normal white noise, while, uh, uh, um, while down here we have a fractal, uh, a, a, a scaling of 1.2. And, yeah? That's a better pointer? Oh, good. Perfect. So now I have to use my left and my right hand at the same time. Oh, good. So, the point is now, my, the Dansk-Erska events, which are these sawtooth shapes, are within this uh, scaling regime while the glacial cycles are out here in sort of uh, the trivial regime, which we would maybe think would be natural since the glacial cycles are probably governed by a very, uh, not a linear response, but a response to the orbital forcing, while the dense Gersk events are part of this internal uh, dynamics. Okay, let's just look at a little bit of detail on, on, the, uh, on the Holocene versus the glacial climate, and you see the Holocene here is pretty, I mean, the, mul the multifractality would give you different scalings for different values of the Q. You remember the Q is, is the order that we took the, 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 the variance to. Um, we have different scaling in, in, in the glacial, and this is multifractal, by, but the whole scene, we cannot really distinguish that from a monofractal. But the slope there, is definitely different from the slope of a half, which should sort of be our null hypothesis. So if we go back to the ornstein ullenberg process or the red noise process, that would, uh, that would put us in this range here, but we are up here. So reshuffling these data, doing the same analysis, gives me all these uh, lines there. So, uh, so I'm pretty sure by the reshuffling uh, um, test, that I'm significantly away from a simple, a trivial process, right? So that's sort of, that's, that's sort of where the red noise ends, that, that I am over here. Uh, these histograms, that's, that's a fractional Brownian motion, right? Of course, this does not prove that. I cannot prove that this is part of that, but I can reject this one over here. I'll always remember that's, that's how we do that. Um, this here is, so, so my concern, of course, would be, is this an artifact of having a, a, a limited amount of data? It's always the problem. You see a scaling, but it's not a perfect scaling, of course, and you would never see a perfect scaling in, in, in a finite uh, record. So, so what do you do? Well, what I did was I chopped up my my, uh, my uh, glacial record, which is 10,000 years into, to, to, which is 100,000 years into 10,000 year bits, the same length as, as the Holocene record. And for each of those, I, I, uh, I calculated this H of Q. You see this H of Q, let, let me just set your eyes, right? This is the, the scaling exponent here as a function of Q. If this is flat, it's a monofractal. If it's not flat, flat, it's, it's a multifractal, right? 
So the Holocene is, is, is pretty much like here. But these are all the bits and pieces of the, of the glacial, and there is a slope going through here. You see Q, is, it's not a big range of Qs, but there's a, there's a definite slope there. Now, the full line here is the full uh, glacier, and these are just the 10,000-year the, the, the bits. The crosses is for the last glacial maximum, the part that I showed before. The, the thing that is important about that is that there's only one small dense Gersk event in that. Okay? So this is more or less the uh, fast fluctuation, fluctuating part we see. So the dense Gersk uh, uh, events are pretty much a part of it. So in, in, in the sense that we cannot really distinguish these events from the fluctuations in the rest of the signal. So this is sort of a, a to me it was a surprising result that, that, that I'd get that out of it. Okay, uh, the, uh, okay, there's a technical detail, but I can, we can actually from these data make a sort of nice uh, F-alpha spectrum for, 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 for the glacier, and you know, monofractal would just be in, in, in 1.1 in this, this plot, so that's the, that's the Holocene versus the, the glacier, okay? So it looks like, that just from, from a, a, a time series analysis, in some sense this is all very naive, but, but, but it seems that, that, that by using these techniques, we can actually see that there's something going on uh, which is different from these two uh, periods. Okay. <coughs> and what has been the focus a lot has been on, 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 the, on the, um, the scaling properties not being as a trivial Gaussian process. That means when you do that... Uh, it's really hard to, um, to imagine that you could make it by something like, like a, 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 a stochastic, a Langevin equation here. Because the noise in, in that would sort of be, be Gaussian and this and that. But one thing, let, let me turn to a, a, another way of doing it, since we have been looking at the, at the, uh, at the, uh, the drift term in the Langevin equation as being linear, right? You do that. But that could be nonlinear. This could be sort of a two-state process here. So now I'm looking at almost the same data. This is also from an ice core going now, time in the, right, uh, in the wrong direction, sorry. This is 10,000 times going in this direction. It doesn't really matter because what you have to see here is that it, it looks like a two-state process here. So you can just look at this, uh, this uh, data series here and see that there's no way I could make that from a linear uh, process, right? But maybe I could do something with, with a, 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 a nonlinear drift, something like jumping between two states, okay? These data, this is uh, dust in the ice cores. Actually, what I'm plotting here are 90,000 points, yearly points. We can get a very high temporal resolution uh, because these grains, they sit in the ice, they don't diffuse uh, in, in contrast to what I showed before, the delta 18, which is due to sublimation and, and refreezing processes, diffuses into the ice, so we don't have as good a resolution as here. But this is a very good resolution, so I have 90,000 points here I can, I, can, uh, I can play with. Okay, so this is my record here. Uh, what I want to do, let's see if it comes up here, I want to describe it like this, right? I want to describe it as a Langevin equation in which I have a drift term and I have a, a noise term. Just think of this as a noise without specifying what this L is right now. Okay? Think of this, I should have written sigma dB. So this is my idea. I can do it like that, but this one here is of course not uh, uh, linear. It has to be a sort of third order polynomial or if it's, if it's a, a, say, the derivative of a potential uh, a gradient flow, it would be a two-well potential, okay? Uh, and, um, well, let me just wait with that a little bit, okay? Now, uh, no, you know something, I want to get everything up there, get everything up there, okay? It's a little busy now. If I take this one here, the series, and do the PDF, probability density, I get a very nice bimodal 
distribution. So we have two states. Okay? I want to describe this through this Langston equation. Now you know that if I have high enough temporal resolution uh, for, small, for, for, for very small times, the, uh, the diffusion term will dominate the drift term, right? So this one here should, in principle, go as square root of delta t. So delta t going to zero, square root of delta t dominates delta t, okay? So how could I get this term out? Well, I could just calculate this delta t as taking the difference between two consecutive points, which is my highest resolution. I do that, that's this curve in B, okay? Now I, uh, I'll, I'll do it in, in five minutes. Um, now I do the PDF of this one here. That should of course be my Gaussian noise here, okay? I do the PDF, it's not Gaussian. It's far from being Gaussian. I, and I, you know, I start, I, I get puzzled with that because actually if I, you know, I know how these data come about, they're sort of averaging, uh, precipitation events, 20 a year and so on. So central limit theorem should tell me, darn, this should be Gaussian, it's not Gaussian. So I have to, to rely on something else. Central limit theorem doesn't work in, in this case, okay? So it has to be a noise which has such a strong tail that even averaging would keep the tails. That's the Levy noise, right? Or an alpha stable process. Alpha stable processes, uh, process in which the, uh, the variance diverge in such a way that the averaging procedure you have in the, in the, for the uh, essential limit theorem would give you a specific class of processes. These are the yeah, alpha stable. Now you can make a Langevin equation for alpha stable uh, processes here. It's a little more complicated because it's not uh, continuous. You have jumps in there, and those jumps means that the Fokker-Planck equation equivalent of the, of the, um, the Langston-Wang equation here becomes a little more complicated here. You can recognize the fungal planck equation here. The, uh, uh, this is from the, um, from the drift term. But the diffusion term here, uh, you have to, uh, to do it in, in, in Fourier space because you know the uh, characteristic function of, the, of your alpha noise. But if you look at the alpha being two here, you recognize this as just a Fourier transform of the Laplace, and then it will be the normal uh, Fokker-Planck equation, but it's not. If alpha is smaller than two, uh, you have this. Okay, so now this should be my starting point for understanding the, the data here. Now I want to solve this Fokker-Planck equation the other way around, in the sense that I know my stationary distribution, that's the one over here, that's my stationary distribution, uh, so I know my P, I'll take the stationary, this is the Fokker-Planck equation for the conditional, so if I look at the stationary, it's just to be a zero over here, so I can solve this equation for my P. Uh, given my P, I can solve this equation for my F, right? Uh, when I know the noise, all I have to know is the alpha that I plug in here and the sigma, and I get that all from here, and I can do that. There's a little more details uh, to it, but I, I don't want to go into that, oh, I'm sorry, uh, well, I miss, actually I missed one. I can do that, I can calculate my F, and it's, it's more or less this one here upside down as you would get from the ordinary for Planck. It's not exactly because it's Ling Wing. I can simulate, I can make a process, and you wouldn't be able to see it, see it differently from this one here, and actually you see that the PDF I get from my simulation, that's, the, that's the, uh, the thin curve here. You get it for the noise, you cannot even see that, and you can even blow it up. I can get this one exactly with alpha stable noise, okay? Good, I'm almost over time, so a few conclusions here. Um, there are differences between the different states, which of course I missed by just doing a long uh, power spectrum of, of that. The Holocene, Looks like a monofractal process, but it's not a, a simple uh, Gaussian process, even though it's close to it. The, the glacial is, is, is multifractal, and what's probably most important is that these Dansk-Oerska events, part of this intrinsic part of the, of the dynamics in, in this uh, scene in this way here. So, uh, and it turns over to, 
sort of trivial scaling when, when sort of glacial cycles set in, uh, as I see it, uh, which we should probably uh, expect. So I hope that, uh, that uh, this uh, convinced you that we can do something with time series analysis that would, of course, in the end, take us back to, to a dynamical understanding because that's sort of next step. Okay, thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Peter. We have some questions. While well, people are thinking of a question, I will ask a question. <laughs> oh, we have a question, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yes. 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 It's actually. I. Th I think. I mean. The, the, first. I, I. completely agree. I mean. First, differently, you would say, how can it be that a red noise process, they could get away with that at all, right? Because you. I mean, you, you assume a separation of, 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 of time scales. You, you assume, uh, uh, you know, in, independent noise, which means that you have sh short time correlations and this and that. But then you go in and you see from the scale basis, well, there are long time correlations and this and that. And of course, the type of models that we need, the reason why I sort of, uh, you know, insisted on, you know, doing the Langshivang, way, which took me to some strange noise that I cannot explain, was that you know, I was, you know, I, I was sort of troubled with doing, say, fractional Brownian motion. I mean, you, you, we know that we have a Markov process. We don't, we know that, you know, if we do delay equations, uh, things like that, that would give us long time memory and so on, that's really just a, you know, an approximation because, I mean, after all, Navier-Stokes equation, you can, you can, I mean, you integrate it forward from the state you're in. You don't need, you don't need to know what the eddies were a uh, hundred years ago, right? So, so somehow from physics, we have to be puzzled about these long time okay. correlations uh, that we see in the data, because it's not in the Navier-Stokes equation. It's, it's, it, it, and it, it somehow comes from the hierarchy of of longer and longer memory scales because the processes get slower and slower. Yeah. Okay, I guess we're going to have to move on yep. in the interest yep. of time, but thank you very much, Peter. And now I'd like to introduce, actually, it's another Peter, Peter, Jan-Peter Muller, who will give us a presentation on geocomplexity and scale surface processes and remote sensing of geosystems, geocomplexity and scale. Oh, it's been repeated <laughs> twice, excuse me. So I didn't do I that. think you'll just give this talk once, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try not to repeat every word. And, if I'm, and, I, I've no idea why that happened. Mm. Um, so, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, somewhat left field from the previous talk, but still looking at the color of noise. So I'd like to leave that hanging there, because um, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Um, well, this is supposed to work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Except it works the wrong way. Okay, so I'm going to look at two fundamental physical parameters from remote sensing. Uh, one of which is uh, digital elevation that I've spent almost 30 years working with. Um, and another one, uh, which is the other side, in terms of um, it's somewhat a reflection of what the microstructure of the elevation itself is, is concerned with the bidirectional reflectance, uh, an albedo of different surfaces. So I'd like to show you something about the observations of the scaling uh, and also give you a rather nice snazzy look into the future, uh, the possibility of being able to have an infinite zoom through imagery by nature of the information contained within individual images. Now, my starting point uh, is uh, obviously um, geoscientists for the purposes of trying to understand the formation of uh, plate tectonics um, of geomorphology. They need 
global topographic information and also bathymetric information. Uh, what's perhaps not so well known is that um, uh, space agencies also need this. And because space agencies uh, require this, um, they don't want any old topography, anything that you happen to digitize off a map, which is, of course, what we've been using for the last 40 odd years. Um, they want to have uh, elevation information, which actually does have quality control and quality assurance. So if you're trying to predict uh, uh, when a volcanic um, eruption is going to happen by monitoring its dome, or you want to look at flood inundation, or you want to look at landslides, uh, then you need extremely accurate uh, topography. Uh, but also, if you actually want to process any remote sensing data at all, you also require uh, very high accuracy topography. But part of the reason for this, and part of the reason for the amount of activity going on in an organization called the Group on Earth Observations, which is sponsored and supported by UN agencies as well as space agencies and a whole variety of other NGOs, is, of course, uh, the infamous tsunami on the 26th of December uh, 2004. And I'm sure this um, video won't work, but uh, we'll try it anyway. No, it didn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, the point is that uh, uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see the very poor state of uh, topography over the oceans that still exists to the present day in this particular part of the world. And this is a severe limitation in terms of being able to predict accurately uh, landfall. So, because I'm not interested in promoting commercial solutions uh, to elevation information. I'm only interested in open source data without any restrictions at all. Um, I'd just like to wander down memory lane for a moment, and partly this is because uh, of trying to promote the idea that any old data isn't good data. And I think, to a large extent, we've uh, been living in that world where any data at all uh, we can apply and look at scaling, but we need to know something about it. So it started uh, in the 1980s, in fact, it started before the end of the Cold War. Uh, the military map sources were released um, without any quantification of the accuracy. And in the 1990s, another set of military information was released, downscaled. Um, certain countries, uh, Canada now, as well as the United States and Mexico, uh, and the only country in Europe, I'm afraid, is Sweden, have an open source policy towards elevation information. And now we have this brand new source, uh, which since 2001 has completely revolutionized uh, elevation and the possibilities of looking at scaling uh, therefrom. And this is from Earth Observation. So I'm going to discuss a little bit about the characteristics uh, of these different platforms like laser altimetry, radar altimetry, stereo, scientophrometry, and ground level and also discuss the new generation of elevation models which actually include quality information and which I would say are now just about ready and fit for purpose for doing scaling analysis. So in the 1980s, we had eTOPO5. This was a subsample military map data set. Uh, we had similar resolutions around 10 kilometers uh, for bathymetry and also for the land surface. The bathymetry has got down to uh, the order of about four to five kilometers in most places, particularly in deep ocean. Um, whereas, of course, the land has now got down to 30 meters. The production date predates the falling of the Berlin Wall. Now, in the 1990s, and unfortunately, lots and lots of geophysicists used this data set without properly appreciating that about 40% of it is garbage. Uh, and I will show you the reason why it's garbage. In the lower right, you can see the various different sources, and although it's impossible, I'm sure, to read this, because I can barely read it on the screen, let alone in the audience, you can see the different colors, and you can see uh, the kind of dark blue, bluey-green color. That's the military map data that existed at the time from the US. And the red data uh, existed from operational navigation charts of one to a million scale, uh, which were at best um, accurate to the order of uh, several kilometers, uh, and at worst uh, would enable your plane to fly into a mountainside. 
Um, so from the point of view uh, of the quality of the data, and you can see also the data for Canada, the data for Greenland, uh, the data for a large part of South America. And this is what, for example, the WRF or WARF model uh, uses in hydrology and also the same WARF model uh, that's used for looking at atmospheric effects. It's garbage. The point is that it should not be used. And I'm going to show you some reasons why. So here's an example of one of the reasons why an assessment uh, of the elevation data against uh, ERS-1 radar altimetry uh, for the continent of Australia uh, from a paper from 2003. And uh, there's two different data sets, uh, both at one, uh, one's at one kilometre, the globe data set or terrain base, and the other one uh, is this 10 kilometre. And in fact, the old military map data in this particular uh, place has much closer agreement. You don't need to be able to read numbers here. You can see that it's green and the other one is blue. And the blue means that there's a large negative bias in the globe data sets as well as some very significant differences of the order of kilometres. When you actually look in detail against this radar altimetry data set, as we did in some papers in JGR, uh, then you can see how poor quality uh, some of them are. Uh, and so if you're trying to get at scaling, if you're trying to look at very, very minute changes uh, that are taking place, particularly because 70% of the Earth's land surface is deemed as flat, uh, then, of course, it becomes rather important if you're using information uh, which has accuracies only on the order of 65 metres. And the accuracy of the radar altimetry data itself uh, <coughs> is only rather comparable to the accuracy of the G-TOPO 30 when compared against airfields. But, of course, there are quite a lot of airfields in the world where it may be flat on the airfield, uh, but, of course, it's not flat anywhere close by. So, because of this uh, rather poor uh, data set, uh, <coughs> we've been looking over the last 15 years at the use of Earth observation. And in particular, laser altimetry from the ISAT satellite, where we have 5 to 15 centimetre height accuracies, very poor horizontal sampling on the order of tens of kilometres away from polar regions. We have a whole variety of different stereo uh, data sets from SPOT, ASTA, uh, IRS, 3P, JAXA, um, and all the old data sets from pre-spot 4 are all in the public domain, so that's why I've included it, because, of course, the latest data set uh, is not. And then we have data sets from radar interferometry, um, and the most important mission, which has happened in 2001 from SRTM, and very recently from Tandon X, albeit that the data is heavily restricted. So looking firstly at ISAT uh, data, you can see uh, the coverage uh, from the greyness in uh, that particular observation period. And unfortunately, this technology was very much state-of-the-art when it was launched. Um, one of the lasers failed almost immediately. Another, fa uh, another failed disgracefully over a, a longer time period, and so they had to limit the time periods. And here you have um, this phenomenally good in terms of vertical height accuracy, 2 to 14 centimetres um, over the ice sheets, but with a large spacing between them on the order between 500 and 1,000 metres. So the difficulty about applying spectral analysis of any kind at all, letting uh, aside the fundamental issue of do I use spherical harmonics or uh, do I use a stand for, uh, Fourier or do I use a wavelet? Can I use box counting for something... Uh, that includes this level of geometric distortions near the pole. So basically, uh, because of all those questions, it's probably not possible uh, to use this. Now, the good news is there's a five-spot uh, ISAT-2 system uh, due for launch in 2017, and um, someone who evidently uh, grew up with Star Wars, there's a JEDI system uh, in development for the International Space Station in 2019. Um, uh, but they will all suffer from these problems, these same problems. If you're monitoring ice, you want to make sure that the orbit is rigid, fixed over the same point on the surface, so you can study the variation in the ice thickness uh, and look at the difference between evaporation uh, and ablation. So basically, um, it's probably not terribly useful for scaling studies. 
An alternative is the ASTA uh, data set uh, created um, by a small Japanese company uh, led by Fujisada. And um, you can see in the upper left here uh, um, the fact that you can actually see uh, Mount Everest. Whereas on the right, this is radar, uh, Mount Everest has gone behind the shadow uh, of a nearby uh, mountain. So uh, it's possible to use this data to fill in gaps uh, potentially, and there's been two releases of this data set. It's all not quite fully in the public domain. You have to sign an agreement saying that I am going to work on GEO and I'm going to work on disasters or whatever it is, but effectively it is publicly available, but you're not allowed to share it with your friends. Um, now, this data set represented some one and a half million scenes that were fully automatically processed, uh, that covered uh, the regions that you'll see in a moment had large gaps. But there are some very severe problems, particularly if you're using this for scaling analysis. Here's an example uh, of a comparison between a very high resolution uh, data set with a, a root mean square height accuracy on the order of better than a meter. Uh, and an intercomparison on the left hand side, uh, you can see that there's a general bias in this ASTA data set, negative bias, but also there's quite a large standard deviation. And depending upon the number of overlaps of individual ASTA scenes, uh, the accuracy can vary quite significantly. So that means that if you're trying to apply scaling analysis, you've somehow or other got to compensate for the fact that you have variable quality within the field of view that you're actually looking at. That's the reason why this mission, the Shuttle Radar Typographic Mapping Mission uh, from the US and Germany and the Italian Space Agency was such a significant step forward for topography. But this also has its own issues when applied to scaling analysis. Now the difficulty with this was the baseline that was actually chosen for uh, doing the 3D reconstruction was only 60 meters. Um, and that's a very short baseline in order to get uh, sufficiently high um, height precision. But, be that as it may, uh, by taking the raw uh, synthetic aperture radar data, creating single look complex, uh, <coughs> doing cross correlation to a hundredth of a pixel, uh, and then working out the coherence field and unwrapping the phase, you can actually generate a three dimensional model. And this allows you to give height information for every single pixel in the data set. But sometimes you get stuck down a hole or stuck at a boundary and you phase unwrap and phase unwrap and you can never get out of that hole. And that's one of the severe problems with this technique. The other thing is, where are we looking at? Um, elevation uh, from space is the first observable surface. Only the laser actually allows you to penetrate through the vegetative cover. And unfortunately, at the wavelengths, uh, C-band uh, that the SRTM sensor flew, um, we are looking somewhere halfway between uh, the actual ground level here and the tops of the trees. So at the moment, uh, it's not feasible to actually uh, determine that uh, fully automatically, but some work in Australia um, has been able to strip off uh, all of this clutter, apart from the pylons which are associated with electricity distribution. Um, but you can see that all the other features themselves have been stripped off. So this is really what you want to use when you're trying to apply this uh, for looking at scaling studies, both at a continental level and also at a global level. Now, originally only the 90 meter data was available for everywhere but the US, uh, but recently, um, there's been a release, apart from that one rather obvious place, uh, that there's due to be a release in August, uh, the place that's in colour rather than the place that's in pink. Um, and uh, <clears throat> basically uh, all of that data now has been released at one arc second. So we actually have a data set. But the trouble is, as you can see here, there is a cutoff because of the maximum latitude that the shuttle could actually fly at. So again, if you want to do global studies, you have a problem because what are you going to do in this area where you have a cutoff, a sharp line? Now, the assessment of the accuracy has been done uh, by a number of authors 
Uh, obviously, I'm just showing some stuff that we've done. Interestingly, jointly with China, uh, where GPS, uh, which itself uh, can't be used in China, or, or at least you can't acquire data. Um, but working collaboratively, uh, we've done studies all over China uh, for looking at uh, the accuracy. And the accuracy is not quite as good as the accuracy uh, that they specified. And in fact, it's fairly comparable between ASTER and SRTM. But this is the figure I'd like to concentrate on. On the left-hand side is the SRTM, uh, together with uh, actually carving out, or cookie-cutting, as it's called, the hydrological features. On the right is the stereo, and you can see it's littered with these microbes. Well, these microbes, which are littering the surface, are, in fact, residual clouds. So the difficulty that we have with a stereophotogrammetric product worldwide is, yes, Aster is one unique data set that uh, covers the whole globe, but unfortunately it suffers from this severe artifact, particularly in tropical and mid-latitude regions. Now, the SRTM does not, uh, but and interestingly enough, uh, that even with the release of the one arc second SRTM, the effective resolution uh, is around 77 metres in comparison to the Aster, which is reproduced at 30 metres, but effectively is at 80 metres. So we have now uh, these global data sets, and now uh, what we can do uh, is we can merge the two. In some cases, uh, there's one particular one um, in the middle here, uh, where you can see the merge isn't a very good job. You know, the one has a different height relative to the other one. Uh, the one on the right is the one that's now released, uh, also known as SRTM+, Plus, which is the one that I would recommend for doing any scaling studies at all on. It's slowing down. Right, so... Global DEMs are now being produced by fusing together these different data sources and in a very interesting arrangement, Spot Image provided downscaled uh, to seven and a half uh, arc seconds, um, <coughs> about 250 meters uh, data uh, that they'd acquired commercially over North Africa and over various other regions. And this is now, so far as the Committee on Earth Observing Satellites and the Group on Earth Observations these are uh, space bodies. We all recommend uh, that everybody in the community, including anyone interested in doing geomorphology, geomorphometrics or scaling, to only use this and throw away GTOPO30 because you're on a hiding to nothing in terms of the analysis uh, and the results that you get out of that. Right. So the final thing I want to point out is that even when we have uh, satellite data sets like SRTM and we can use radar altimetry data sets, uh, we can actually see uh, very significant differences in height. For example, in um, uh, Greenland here, we can see differences more than 300 meters for Greenland, uh, and this is similarly the case for um, the Rockies, the Andes, Indonesia, and African Rift Valleys. We can also see very significant differences in South America uh, in the Amazon, but that's probably because radar altimetry, a KU band, does penetrate down to the surface. So you need to bear this in mind that they're not always the same. The other thing is uh, that in a former data set, not in the latest GM TED 2010, uh, you can see that there's horizontal line artifacts, which is where the SRTM data joins with the other data sets. Now, the one and only scaling chart I'm going to show in my presentation isn't mine. It comes from Sean and Danielle. Um, <coughs> but uh, basically, um, each of these individual spectra, uh, which have this slope on the order of minus two, um, are taken from different geographic regions. The global one is obviously the bathymetry and the elevation. The GTOPO30 for the US is probably okay. Um, the US 90 meter data is pretty awful, uh, which is probably the reason why it has that strange whiplash curve in it. Um, and interestingly, you can see that unfortunately we can detect the effect of the trees. So uh, this lower Saxony data set, there's no details in the paper, but one is without trees and one is with trees. I presume it's some kind of scanning laser altimeter. And you can see that there is an offset of one to the other. I assume that's not done deliberately to 
make uh, this more visible. The other thing is that uh, topographic surfaces, at least for France, uh, are not monofractal. And what I would argue is that it's time for us to revisit uh, topography uh, because there is now a decent data set with good QA that could be used for this purpose. We can also do the same thing for other planets. We've been doing it, for example, for Mars. Other uh, groups have been doing it in China uh, for the Moon. Uh, we even have a 4.6 kilometer resolution terrain data set. And they're, they're quite small. They're you know, similar size to the Earth's land surface. And all that data is in the public domain. Multiple resolution is as well. Uh, this allows you to get down to 75 centimeters. So in the final few minutes, I'm going to talk about the other aspect of scaling and global data sets that we now have quantified uh, uncertainties of and therefore are able to use for scaling, uh, which is concerned with albedo. This is an example showing the impact of a significant difference in the albedo uh, due to drought in the Sahelian region. Just to remind you what reflectance is, because of course everybody uses reflectance or albedo as if it's exactly the same thing, which of course they're not at all. Um, we have two particular types of uh, albedo. One of course, which is, just has a single sun in the sky, it's like being on the moon. Uh, and um, uh, we're looking at the hemispherical reflectance over all angles. And the other one is called bihemispherical reflectance or white sky or sometimes blue sky. Now, we can make global data sets and we can look at things like Hovmuller plots uh, and uh, also we can look at wavelet uh, decompositions of this albedo. But of course, it's only of the land surface. It doesn't include uh, the oceans. And you can do it with and without uh, ephemeral snow. And one particular data set that I've spent six years working on uh, is this one, uh, which in fact has no gaps other than the fact there's a gap between South America and Antarctica. And this data set is the only one that actually has uncertainty uh, values associated with it. So just as a quick plug, uh, it actually had a big impact on GCM forecasts. I know that probably that doesn't cut much, doesn't cut much ice here, but it did have a good impact. <laughs> so we have a new project uh, from the European Union that's making a 35-year gap-free record of spectral and broadband uh, BRDF albedo. Uh, FAPAR and LAI uh, from a whole variety of different sensors uh, which are shown here from all the way from 1980s including all the geostation ones including all the polar orbiting ones and we can do this because of course we now have access to the supercomputers and disk space and all the rest of it uh, that we've dreamed about for 20 years. We've also developed uh, the entire system for uh, using optical estimation, which is a technique which is very commonplace in atmospheric chemistry, but almost unheard of uh, in Earth observation of land surface processes, um, to actually develop uh, an entire processing chain, which includes an upscaling, making sure that the uncertainty is upscaled appropriately to whatever the resolution is. So generating a time series of eight daily for 14 years and eventually daily for 35 years in various different spectral bands, uh, given information also about the samples. Now, the problem I'd like to focus on is the problem that's an ultimately killer problem for remote sensing. And the killer problem is, here I have my WMO, base surface radiation network, which of course is always on the edge of a pixel. It has to be, you know, by the very nature. And um, unfortunately, it's only looking at a little two meter patch of grass or concrete, I'm not quite sure which, because you can't tell in Google Earth, uh, on the ground. And if we compare that with uh, the variations, we can see that the albedo um, taken from this tiny little patch uh, is higher than the albedo uh, that we see from all the Earth observation satellites. And uh, we only have base surface radiation network for one place on the Earth, about 53 uh, from FluxNet, and that's to validate 149 million square kilometers. So we have a problem in how to do the scaling, which we do from a rather interesting instrument that scans from horizon to horizon, so we can look at the bidirectional reflectance. It shows you a single scan in multiple colors, allows you to compare against other instruments. And for the first time ever, 
we can look at so-called calibration sites to see how do we scale from the order of sub-meter through to the one kilometer uh, that we have. And here is an example of the scaling process as we're going from low altitude to mid to high altitude. And you can see the variability changes. So BRDF is not a dimensionless parameter uh, and a scaleless parameter as Nicodemus tried to convince us of 30 years ago. So finally, uh, this is just a bit of eye candy, uh, is that um, uh, we also have developed a technique for taking stacks of images and uh, 25 centimeter resolution and producing a five centimeter image. Now, we've done this on Mars first, but we're just about to do this in anger to try and create one centimeter images from space of various different places in hot, sunny climates. Um, and here you can see finally the rover tracks themselves, which we can compare with actual pictures taken by the rover. So scaling-wise, we're almost there at the infinite zoom. So in summary, the quality assurance and the traceability, I hope I've convinced you, of these global remotely sensed data sets are becoming at the point at which I would say that you can actually make strong inferences on the scaling behavior of solid Earth surfaces, land surface radiation transfer, and I haven't shown anything about the atmospheric dynamics. So similarly, comparative planetology is becoming realistic as these space-borne data sets become comparable in resolution. And so I believe that we are at dawn of a huge potential uh, for repeat observations of the same geophysical phenomena to be exploited to obtain subpixel scaling information and to really get a handle on the scaling once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, before I take a question, I have to, I forgot to mention that this is being filmed and so we ask people to please speak into the microphone if they have a question. So do we have a question? Please. Uh, my name is Neil Wells. Um, one of the things you didn't talk about uh, was the Sandwell topography data set because in oceanography, <laughs> covers 70% of the Earth. Um, uh, we're having real problems in the bathymetry of the ocean, um, particularly for tidal predictions is one aspect. And um, I was wondering whether you had any thoughts about how the, the work that you're doing on the land could possibly, these methods, how these methods could be translated possibly to the ocean. It, it's of uh, very great interest, particularly over continental shells, uh, because one can use, in areas of high turbidity, one can use very high resolution SAR images in order to invert. This has been done by Susan Lehner and colleagues at DLR in order to be able to get a detailed bathymetry of the continental shelf down to a depth of about 50 meters. Beyond that, of course, radar altimetry is the only thing uh, that can, practically speaking, be employed. Yes. And again, that's an uh, indirect inversion. Mm. So well, I think that the answer is yes, and we've been trying to promote the idea that we could do it over extensive regions of the continental shelves, mm. with the driver being tsunamis rather than necessarily uh, just tides. And uh, so far as the Sandwell data set is concerned, of course, it, it's a reflection of the time when it was actually produced and what was available. Unfortunately, in the intervening time period, there is not that much significant data collection over the ocean to help with that. One ray of light is the UN Treaty of the Seas, Law of the Seas Treaty, has included side-looking sonar of all continental shelves of all the areas in the world, and eventually the UN will release it once agreement is made by the individual countries to release it. So I think okay. there, there, there is something positive so far as that's concerned as well. I just mentioned also, you, uh, you mentioned tsunamis, but of course tsunamis are all uh, in the Indian Ocean, are in the deep water. They're in the 4,000, 6,000 meters. Sure. And um, so to predict the tsunami approaching the continental shelf has to cross a lot of ocean. And uh, we need good bathymetry to get those ray paths. Yep. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm afraid I've just been reminded that 
there's somebody who's coming into this room right after us, so we have to move on. Thank you, Peter. Um, just like to introduce the last speaker in our session, which is Daniel Rothman, who will talk about mass extinctions and biosphere geosphere stability. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting this presentation, and I'd like to thank the rest of you for hanging around until the late morning. Um, <coughs> This is um, work of the last half year or so, and it's arisen um, out of discussions with my colleague Sam Bowering at MIT. All right. And I'd like to begin um, with um, some observational facts, um, uh, a rationale for why this um, talk belongs in a session on uh, scaling, and um, in the end, a basic question. And the first observation is that whenever there have been mass extinctions in the history of life, the carbon cycle has been significantly perturbed. Second observation is that there have been many events in the carbon cycle that one sees in the geologic record, and they're not obviously at all um, accompanied by mass extinction. And so third point is... Um, the range of time scales involved. Most of this talk um, will not cover the missing quadrillion, as we heard about a little bit earlier, um, but the last 500 million years, the Phanerozoic, and during which uh, we'll be looking at time scales ranging from basically tens of thousands of years to uh, millions to maybe tens of millions. However, there's a more recent event, um, the, you know, change, the change in the carbon cycle presently, which arguably is on the order of about 100 years, and so that's relevant, and we'll get to that at the end. And so it's that vast range of time scales that motivates the, um, the, uh, the, the presence of this talk in this session. And so the, the question that we'll ask is, um, what makes um, the two conditions above uh, different? Why is it there are um, carbon cycle events that lead to mass extinctions, or I should say more carefully, are associated with mass extinctions and other events that are not. Okay, so to um, put this in some context, this is an iconic data set um, produced by uh, the paleontologist Jack Sepkoski in the 90s, and what you're seeing here is the evolution of, um, this is a little bit hard to use, biodiversity. And there's no pointer, I su suppose? Yeah, <laughs> you can see it, the evolution of biodiversity over time. And although there's um, much debate, as I'll make clear in a moment, about the uh, shape of the curve, um, the, the major uh, points of uh, change here, that's the Permian-Triassic extinction, that's the demise of the dinosaurs over here, and the Cretaceous-Tertiary extinction. Um, they're not really up for debate, and they've been noticed since the middle of the 19th century. Um, more recently, uh, John Alroy and his colleagues at the Paleobiology Database Project um, have been trying to um, weed out as many of the uh, statistical biases in that curve that I just showed you. And the upper curve is their, um, one of their most recent estimates of the change in biodiversity over time. And as you'll see, again, there are various periods in which there are changes, and those changes are associated, um, the ones that have the negative derivatives are associated with um, extinction events. And here is um, Alroy's best compilation of what the extinction rates are, that's in, un in units of per taxon per interval. The interval is uh, typically about 10 million years in this data set. So there's um, the first issue of time scale that we'll come across in that the extinction rates are typically measured over time scales of about 10 million years in, at least in data like these, whereas the events themselves may be much, much faster, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years. All right. And um, I'll point out that the peaks in that curve um, are the so-called big five extinctions. The first is the Ordovician extinction. The second one um, is uh, known as the Franian Femenian extinction, which probably sounds rather unusual to most of you. Um, some of you may know it as the uh, Devonian extinction. The middle one there is the uh, granddaddy of them all, or the mother of them all, depending on the way you wish to personify it. Um, the uh, end Permian or Permian Triassic extinction. The next one is the end Triassic or Triassic Jurassic extinction. And the final one 
It's the KT, now known as the KP for Cretaceous Paleogene, um, which is um, associated with the uh, demise of the dinosaurs. Okay, so now uh, a statement of uh, scientific philosophy, essentially what's um, motivating um, this study. Um, many people, myself included in the, in the recent past, have tried to seek out the cause of these events. And that's a very reasonable thing to do, but I will argue here that it's not really the basic question. The basic question is not so much causality, but rather stability. And what motivates that statement is that if you look at any of these major events, there's often volcanism involved. In fact, there was a, a session this morning on um, um, massive volcanism associated with several of those extinction events. There's marine anoxia, ocean acidification, and of course climate change are widely implicated in almost all of, all of those events. But we can make two observations. Uh, one is that life and the environment interact. It's not a one-way one street. And, and secondly is that there has to be a complex cascade of events that's perhaps instigated by some type of external stressor such as volcanism, but there is nevertheless a complex cascade. And so seeking a single cause almost begins to be um, virtually implausible. And so what we'll do here is um, seek a formulation of the problem that effectively um, recognizes the possibility of an instability in the biosphere-geosphere system. And so um, the plan for the um, remaining time is going to be rather simple. Um, what we've done is that to assemble a, a database of carbon cycle events, and in that database we'll focus on the magnitude of the event, the time scales of the events, and um, the two of those will give us rates. Um, from that database, we'll infer the conditions associated with mass extinction and we'll attempt to uh, explain what we find in terms of um, elementary dynamics. Okay, so as an example, um, this is um, one of the most studied of the uh, extinction events on the list. This is the end Permian extinction. And this is the kind of um, uh, geochemical data that we will be assembling. Um, the vertical axis there is the uh, carbon isotopic um, composition of carbonate rock. And what you'll see is that it sort of zooms along here without doing much of anything terribly interesting. And um, we associate that with a um, ba basically a pre-existing steady state. And then around over here, it seems to lose the steady state is no longer steady, to be um, perfectly agnostic about the interpretation. And, and then it seems to undergo some type of rapid change, which actually has the shape not so dissimilar from a, a singularity going in the negative direction. And the uh, peak, or trough if you wish, uh, the, the point of that, downward point of that spike, is pretty much coincident with the um, uh, peak rate of extinction in the location in which these data were obtained, which is in South China. Now, um, again, since this is a session on, on, uh, on scaling, um, note the time scale there. That basically uh, gives you an, an example of how well um, geochronologists can date these things. Um, the horizontal extent is over is about 200,000 years, but the accuracy of those three dates which are known is um, within 30,000 to 90,000 years, depending on the actual date. And so the um, the event, the carbon cycle event, is actually taking place largely over, over this last bit, and that's perhaps measured in on the order of 10,000 years. Maybe more, maybe less, we don't really know because we only have those three dates. Okay, so what we're gonna do is assemble a bunch of these. And I would love to show you some long time series like we saw, for instance, earlier from the ice core records, but it doesn't work that way in this type of geology. Um, essentially, one gets these carbon isotopic records. Um, they occur at discrete points in time, and they are episodic. There's no question that they are essentially um, isolated events, but I can't show you some clean time series in which we can point out those events. We just have to know where to go to look for them. And then we parameterize them um, with two variables. Um, one is the size of the event, and we call that 
big delta R, the R is for the response to, say, perturbation. And the other is the time scale over which the perturbation occurs. We call that a tau with the ENV means that it's the environmental perturbation. Okay, and we assemble a bunch of those and put them on a plot, right? And so the red ones are the big five um, mass extinctions. And the blue ones are um, other members of the database which um, effectively are not associated with any serious extinction. And you'll see they range in time scales from a little bit more than 10,000 years to a um, you know, million to 10 million years. And you'll see a wide variety of, um, of events there. And to give you an idea at the two extremes, this is a uh, last glacial maximum to Holocene uh, uh, carbon cycle change in terms of what its isotopic shift would be based on the best estimate, when actually what its isotopic shift is in the oceans based on the best estimates from the various um, data that have been assembled. Um, another one that's well known is the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And then there's a bunch of others and it would um, bore you to death if I actually showed off my ability to have memorized what all of those symbols mean, right? Um, but the what, what clearly shows up is that the, um, the, the PT, the TJ, the Ordovicians seem to be sort of out there by themselves. The KT and the FF are out here more or less with the others. However, as many of you may know, the, the KT is uh, associated with a bolide impact, also volcanism, but it's, it's, um, its uh, provenance as a carbon cycle event is at best um, unclear. And the uh, Franian Fermanian extinction um, is sometimes even thought of as a lack of origination rather than extinction. It's a, one of the more mysterious of the extinction events. So um, that's our elementary data. But to move on, I'll, I'll just um, imagine that many of the people here in the room, perhaps like me, um, don't really have such a great feeling of what this isotopic variable really means. And so what we're going to do is um, transform this um, space into a physical space so that um, it becomes a little bit clearer what's going on. And so we have a model of the carbon cycle. It's basically a loop between photosynthesis going this way and respiration going that way. And what we want to do is obtain um, the change in the size of this inorganic reservoir, which is, you can think of it as a CO2 reservoir. All right, um, in response to um, what, what that change is as a function of a change to the uh, flux of carbon going into it and the change of the isotopic compositions that it carries. And so we'll assume that there's an anomalous flux and that the anomalous flux derives from an isotopic composition of um, um, respired organic matter. Right. And um, we will... Um, effectively impose a model on the isotopic events. And the model is that the isotopic shifts are linear in shape, not in dynamics, but in shape. That is, they just are a linear ramp. And that means that we can look at the, the change from the, the time at which the steady state seems to be lost down to the bottom, we'll call that delta R, and then the time over which that takes place as um, tau env. And given that model, we solve the model, we write down equations for, the, um, for this two-box model. We have a model of the change in the carbon cycle, we solve it, and we get this um, relation for what we want, the, the relative change in the, isotope, in, the, um, in the size of the inorganic carbon reservoir. If you wish, a geochemist would say it's the size of the DIC reservoir normalized by the original size, dissolved in organic carbon. Um, it has um, the first term here, and that's the size of the isotopic shift. This is the um, imposed perturbation by the model, and that is that we'll assume that the, uh, the, the light isotope is coming from um, remineralized organic matter. Right. And so this, these, this, this, this prefactor over here is exactly what geochemists would call isotopic mass balance for an instantaneous change. It is, you imagine if you dump a lot of light carbon into the ocean and you measured its isotopic composition before and after, you can back out how much um, you dumped into the ocean and that's all that that pre prefactor says. The time dependent term over here says that if you continue doing it, that's, that's the um, 
you, you have to be pumping more into it. And that time-dependent term um, has associated with it the time constant of the system, and that's the residence time, tau naught, of carbon in the oceans, which is about 100,000 years. Okay, so after applying that transformation, uh, something uh, rather remarkable happens is that most of this data ends up falling on a reasonably straight line with some scatter. And that reasonably straight line has a slope that's pretty close to one. And because it has a slope pretty close to one on this log-log plot, it means that that line is um, indicating a characteristic rate of change in the process, specifically a characteristic rate constant given by that expression. And so um, our job in the remaining time is to identify what that characteristic rate is and then interpret it. Right. And so the first step in the identification is to um, uh, make a few, uh, basically use some standard geochemical reasoning. Um, the geochemical system is composed of two parts, uh, inorganic carbon and organic carbon. The organic carbon is, is lighter. Um, there's a fraction F of carbon that's buried is organic. That fraction F um, turns out over the missing quadrillion to be about one-fifth, all right, 0 0.2. It fluctuates, but it always comes back to a number around 0 0.2. Delta I over here is the average value of all crustal carbon. And so the way it works out with the isotopes is that the carbonate which we're looking at is separated by delta I by a fraction F. This is separated from that by a fraction 1 minus F. Okay, so that's all you need to know for what happens next. What happens next is that we're going to look at the long time asymptotic behavior of that plot. So it's going to look at the upper right hand corner of that plot. We can ignore the constant term in the expression we had and we can just um, see it as the expression we have there at the top. And then we make a remark. We say, what is a sort of large isotopic event that occurs at a long time scale? Well, we ask the question more precisely and say, what is the largest isotopic event that could um, maintain steady state while it changes, while the system is changing? In other words, we ask, what is the um, um, limit on the uh, largest isotopic event um, for which the change is quasi-static? And that change uh, corresponds to changing delta 1 to delta i, all right? So we substitute um, the appropriate um, factor of f up above, and we end up with the fastest quasi-static rate, all right? And the fastest quasi-static rate gives an e-folding time of uh, roughly about one and a quarter million years. Right. And then we draw that line on the graph, and uh, lo and behold, it pretty much goes through the middle of the data, all right? So, um, in, uh, there's a gray region over there which is uh, basically allowing a 10% error in F, which I said is typically taken to be 0 0.2, and a 10% error in tau naught, which is typically taken to be 100,000 years. So, uh, the immediate implication, which I, I find rather fascinating, is that um, the system appears to be self-organizing to a marginally stable state. That is. Um, Strictly speaking, the right-hand side of this plot is, um, refers to quasi-static fluctuations. The left-hand side refers to dynamic fluctuations. But the border between the two, as quasi-static goes to dynamic, also appears to be a border between an ostensibly uh, stable um, change and an ostensibly unstable change. And the instability I'm referring to is that is it's uh, biospheric unstable and that we have these um, big carbon cycle events on the left, big extinction events on the left, but not so clearly on the right. Um, since this is a session on scaling, I'll also point out that um, these, um, this, this mouse is not responding very clearly, but you see the dots are more or less uniformly distributed over the vertical axis, also the horizontal axis too. And that means that the um, histogram of these events is not so far from power law. It's not so far from a log normal either, so it's a little bit uh, unclear to say. But what we do have is self-organization self to a marginally stable state, and it, it's possibly critical also. Okay, um, finally, um, just to um, provide another view of the data, we can also um, define what we call an extreme event. 
that is an extreme event which occurs at the um, asymptotically fast, um, for, for an asymptotically fast event, and an asymptotically fast event, I mean um, rates that are much faster than that um, um, characteristic rate R star. What this means is that the time scale is no longer part of the problem, and we identify that extreme event with changing delta one to just more than the long-term crustal average, because that long-term crustal average is, acts essentially as a, as a damping on the isotopic system. It's always returning um, the delta i isotopic composition, which is minus five, right? And if we um, go beyond it, it's it's a it's a measure of an uh, basically an effectively um, serious event, right? So we just call that extreme, and um, we. Um, make that definition because we imagine that the only time such events might occur would be if the carbon cycle itself were undergoing some type of intrinsic instability so that it was driven past the point which it would normally not like to go past. So that's a specific number of a quarter that we can predict for that that's down there on the bottom of the page. And when we draw the line for the extreme events, we get that um, line there that's going horizontal. And um, nicely, the PT and the TJ and the Ordovician fall just above it, which sort of suggests that they got past that point but couldn't get any further. And it also more or less identifies a kind of sweet spot in the system, which is interesting, and I don't have a good explanation for it. All right. Um, I'll point out, um, because I'm going to make an allusion, uh, get back to it in a moment, that there's this sector over here which um, is empty. That may be significant and it may be not, and I'll, I'll make another point about that in a few minutes. So in the remaining time, I want to do two things with this data. First is to uh, eliminate the blue and red color screen, scheme and um, go back to um, Alroy's extinction rate data and effectively add a third dimension to the plot. And that's over here. So here the uh, circle diameters represent Alroy's extinction rates. And what you can see is that the, uh, the big events are clearly clustering up here in the extreme sector on the unstable side of the characteristic rate. Right? And um, this, by the way, is um, as a big extinction rate, but if you were watching carefully um, or earlier, you might have noticed that the Cambrian, that is the first um, 50 million years or so of the Phanerozoic, which I showed, has anomalously high background extinction rates. And so this is basically a, a, a carbon cycle event which occurs on the right side of the line, which probably has no particular um, environmental effect whatsoever and is associated with a high extinction rate because back then that's what happened. Okay, the next thing I want to do is, is get rid of the modeled variable on the, on the vertical axis and go back to purely observational variables. And what that means is that we deform the phase boundaries um, using the theoretical re relations that we had, but now we plot the um, isotopic compositions themselves. So what you're looking at now is um, um, purely observational data, not having gone through any kind of model filter. And, and what you see is that um, these events, again, cluster around the characteristic rate, which is um, putatively marginally stable, and that these um, big extinctions are occurring up there above the extreme line and to the left of the, um, the, uh, the characteristic rate. So finally, I'd like to um, show you the uh, lifetime of the n Permian event. Right? It starts down here, and now we're plotting it going up because we're taking the absolute value. And it begins its life at the characteristic rate. It scoots along at that boundary. And then sometime around, I don't know, is that about 60,000 years from its start, um, it crosses the boundary. And when it crosses, it doesn't really wait for much. It just zooms straight up. So that looks like an unstable system, in, implying that the boundary is a line of stability. But um, that, that's really just um, a conjecture. Okay, um, finally, and I know I'm running out of time, um, that's the event that interests us all, all right? It's clearly in this um, uh, seemingly empty sector on the wrong side, if you wish, of the stability line. Um, the only other event in the history of um, 
last 500 million years that we we're sure has crossed that line is the, uh, the PT. And so it's uh, another reason to um, be interested in it. Okay, so finally, and conclusions. Um, there's no doubt that um, all of the events in the geologic record are in some sense different, all right? If, no other, if for no other reasons than, than their, initial conditions, their initial conditions are different, and probably the environmental stressors on the system are different. But somehow, um, the major environmental change which results is occurring at a characteristic rate, and it appears to be associated with marginal stability. Um, the perturbations that exceed that rate um, tend to result in a biospheric instability, and after reaching a critical size, they result in mass extinction. Um, one might be led to ask, naturally enough, what sets the characteristic rate? Um, it seems pretty clear to us that it's probably microbial in origin. There are two numbers that set it. One is the fraction of carbon that's buried that's organic, and then the other is the time scale of carbon's residence time in the ocean, both of which are the result of microbial processes. And lastly, um, these conclusions apply at time scales clearly over basically 10,000 to a million or so years. Um, whether they apply to the uh, modern event is an open question. So, thank you. So, thank, thank you, Daniel. And uh, do we have some questions? Please go to the microphone, please, yeah. Yes, uh, could you go back to the, uh, when, when you have, the, after the transformation data that, that you have? Which data? The, the um, when you draw the, the line, almost the, with one, after the, after the transformation, it's still with the red dots and the... I'm sorry, I don't know, so... Well, well uh, previous one. Well, well even uh, in this one, if uh, it, it won't let me change this one, okay. one more, one more, one before. It won't let me change. I can't. No, there. Well, uh, I, there? I was. How's well, that? Well, I was expecting. I was expecting if, if you could comment that the that the mass extinction with dots, the red dots, uh, were almost um, had a uh, opposite slope that that the. So if you, if you could go back one more, it's very clear. Well, one, even even here you see the the um, the red dots. Slope like that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, could, you, could you comment on that, please? Um, uh, I'm inclined to think it's chance, but um, I. I what I did say earlier is that there seems to be a kind of sweet spot in the center of that graph. And if we, you know, make a hypothesis, for example, that these events are power law distributed, what seems to mitigate against that is that there seems to be um, a, a tendency for the events to have a characteristic size that's in the middle in terms of time scale and um, event duration. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> it's an interesting observation. Other questions? Yes, please. So now you only mentioned the, the KT as sort of annoyingly uh, due to an impact, but as I understand it, more of the extinctions were due to impacts, and, 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 and that shouldn't fit in here, I guess. So, um, to my knowledge, there is no other extinction event that has been associated with any sureness with an impact. But I should add to that that the KT event is also associated with massive volcanism. Last question or another question? Yep, to the microphone, yes, please. Hi, my name is Tommy Warren. And uh, you had that interesting devel development of the PT. The, uh, was it the next or a couple of slides after this one? Could you please show it? Uh, you want me to go forward? Yeah. More? Yeah. Yeah, one more, I think. Yeah, yeah. this one. Yeah. Uh, you had that nice line, but how, that, how, how does that, kind of like the PT after that event, how does it return to stability? Oh, what does it return to? Yeah. It's in another dynamical regime. The, the graph would 
th th there'd, there'd be a decay going down. But it, it's sort of, it's no longer something that we would want to display on such a curve. The, the, the axes don't have any meaning in, in that sense. Other questions? Maybe just one quick one. You just considered the carbon isotopes. What about oxygen isotopes, which have also been studied quite a bit through this period, right? Does that tell um, you? So the question with oxygen isotopes, uh, which has probably ultimately gotten um, by other means, is changes in temperature. And so, but so you, you know, don't, the, you don't the PT, think that the PT, they, mm -hmm. it's an interesting question as to whether the PT event, for example, is a warming event. Yeah, well, that's right. it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, there are, in principle, innumerable proxies one can associate with each of these events, and they are. I mean, the paper's written every week on measuring some new proxy for all of them. The problem is, is that they, the, the, the reason I, I focus here on carbon is because it's the best studied. Mm -hmm. It's the most understood and it's the best studied and most widely available. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, before everybody leaves, just to remind you, at 1.30 in B10, we have our Richardson, Me the NP section has the, N has the Richardson Medal um, lecture uh, and followed by the contributed part of this so geocomplexity and scale. So we'll have a whole afternoon, in fact, of geocomplexity and scale. So thank you very much. Thank you to speakers. Yeah.